Creation. Imagination. It's the code that courses through humanity. Some say it's the soil that grows beauty. But some would argue it's the bottleneck that prevents reason and analysis. A dam of artistry that prevents the free flowing of edifying waters. This realm of creation is stewarded by four mages, but these aren't just any mages. These four are more likened to storytellers. These mages are called describers. Zero Fox Given is known for his ambition, efficiency, and hard work. Peacock, or Flaw Peacock, is second of his kind, known for his love, religiosity, and creativity. The Hermit, is known for his introspection, compassion, and exploration of the boundaries of this realm. And Detective Viewer is known for his shrewdness, moralism, and investigation of the truth. These four, the realm they reside in, and the channel that courses through it, sits on the precipice of a great disaster, or a grand new age. One, where there will be no creation, only This has been a long time coming. In this video, we'll be going over Act 3 of Inscription. We'll be digging into it like we have in the past two acts. But in addition, we'll also be going over the console ARG. There will be a smaller, shorter, more quickly released video covering Casey's mod and the main Inscription ARG. Before we get started, I want to go over a bit of a content warning. I'm going to keep this vague and brief as to not spoil anything we'll be discussing themes surrounding the topic of suicide. In this video, it'll be a bit more abstract, but in the next video, it would be a bit more historical. That's all I'm gonna say. To be honest with you, on the scale of sensitivity, even if you are moderately sensitive to this topic, I think you'll be fine in these two videos. The only exception, I think, would be if you're extremely sensitive, I would advise discretion. But like I said, in this video, we'll be going over a more thematic exploration of that topic, that theme. Real quick, some shout outs. Shout out to ThanGuy23 for this Stardew Valley-esque fan art. Shout out to Catherine for this really cool cross stitch of the logo, the Flaw Peacock logo. That's talent, and you should really look into selling these. Speaking of crafts, big shout out to Brachia for adding this physical Flaw Peacock card to his menagerie of handcrafted beast cards. Shout out to Nikki K for this fan-made animation uh, surrounding themes regarding my uh, my avoiding of the topic of fear and hunger. I'm not actually avoiding it, I'm just, it's just a hard game. This one just came across my desk. Big shout out to Sad Cherries underscore on Instagram for this really cool bit of fan art in the style of Who's Lila. Shout out to Lover of Beards, the OG Who's Lila investigator for creating a Who's Lila mod that replaces the daemon with Floppentine from my live stream. The hybrid cyber homunculus that hijacked said live stream. <laughs> And finally, big, big shout out to Rando Horn for completing, finishing Flawed Theory. An all-time Friday Night Funkin' banger, but I might be biased. And as always, the biggest thank you to all of you for your support, and most importantly, your patience. Now, let's get right into our soft finale of our exploration of Inscription, Act 3. Remember, at the end of Act 2, Poe used a bit of old data fished up by the dredger to inscribe a corrupted trump card. This card allowed Poe to form the game on the disc to their own desired design, establishing the tech-centered hegemony of Poe. If you notice, we see floppy disks flying from the right of the screen. These will be the cards we use in Poe's game, and I do find that fitting inscribed cards being memory cards in this tech-themed version of inscription. The hewn stones that once signified the four scribes are replaced by these sort of nondescript rectangles with square-shaped holes carved within them. I'm not sure what these are supposed to be just yet. Also, as we see Poe establish his hegemony, we see a 3D rendering of Poe. If you notice, Poe only has one arm, with a twist crank on the side without an arm. We will explore some interesting repetitions of cranks within Inscription and in Daniel Mullen's games, but something interesting comes to mind. Crank operated like a jack-in-the-box. Jack. The jack is a trick card in Carnoffle code. It literally represents the Carnoffle. 
Coincidence? Probably. But while we're here, let's go ahead and remind ourselves this center to the mystery that is inscription, the old data, the Carnoffel coat, and its true purpose. As a reminder, there's something about the old data that gives its possessor ultimate power. It gave Leshy the power to establish the hegemony of Act One, Leshy's inscription. And now it's given Poe the power to establish his hegemony in Act Three, Poe's inscription of Botopia. We'll be keeping this floppy disk of inscription and its contents both new and old in mind. When the screen fades into the next act, I can hear a very faint synth noise in the background that sounds very similar to the game work startup music from the Hex. My original plan for Walk was to have it be an almost... Perhaps this is to further establish that this game was developed with the operating system that would become the GameWorks development kit. This won't be the only hint regarding this. You done gawking? We can start? Good! This is Botopia, a once great technological paradise. It's ruled over by four, uh, uberbots, that's right. And you've got to get out there and beat them. Why? To perform the great transcendence, of course. Doesn't matter what that means. You want it, okay? The great transcendence. To transcend is to go beyond one's limitations. So are we going beyond the limitations of this floppy disk? How could Poe achieve such a thing? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Pressing S or down will cause our character to attempt to stand up, just like in Leshy's Act 1. But for now, we are locked to this table. Just like the fashion of typical GameWorks games, we have this fixed position, point-by-point -point movement system. Botopia used to be safe for travelers. Now rogue bots block all the major roads. And now we enter our first card battle. You're not used to seeing five lanes, are you? Unless you could never pull that off. Much of how I describe the tech deck set in Act 2 still applies here. We slowly build up energy, one per turn. And remember, most cards within the tech set do zero to one damage, with few exceptions. So we will have to stall and tank damage until we have just enough energy to play our powerful cards. But here's what will help us in this new edition. Our resource cards are now empty vessels instead of squirrels. We can actually see some empty vessels in the scenery of Poe's factory in Act 2, but now they're actual playable cards. Empty vessels cost one energy and do no damage, but can tank a whopping two damage. Mind you, Poe is working with the same deck as we are. This will be able to tank the plurality of one damage cards for two turns. We want to lead with our empty vessel to tank the incoming damage. On turn two, we will have two energy to spend. Since right now the only two cost card in our deck is the energy bot, we will always draw it on our opening hand. Keep this in mind for strategy reasons, not narrative literary reasons. I would recommend having only one two cost card in your deck and developing your strategy around that card. This is the fair hand mechanic of act three. At the start of turn two, we draw an empty vessel. And before playing the vessel, we play the energy bot. This increases our energy by one, meaning we can play the empty vessel right after. It won't work the other way around. So now we have four energy to work with on turn three instead of just three. On top of this, we can now tank five damage, further increasing our stall potential. On turn three, now that we have four energy, we can play a three cost card and a vessel. So I draw one more vessel and we have two choices for our three cost card in our hand. The shield bot does one damage and has a shield that guards it from damage once before breaking. This means it can guarantee two turns of tanking no matter the damage. The sniper bot also does one damage, but it allows us to choose where it does its one damage. A single well-placed sniper bot shot can really neuter Poe's strategy. So let's see it in motion. I have the sniper bot take out the explode bot. This causes it to do 10 damage to all adjacent cards. Sure, it kills our already weakened empty vessel, but it also kills our opponent's automaton, so we've doubled the value of our single point of damage. On turn four, we have five energy, not enough to play our powerful cards, so there's no point in drawing from our main deck. So let's go ahead and draw another vessel to increase our tank potential. But honestly, there really is no other move here. We place our shield bot and vessel down, and on turn five, with six energy, we can draw the double gunner, play it, and secure our win. This is the same double gunner from Act 2, doing a bifurcated two damage, so two damage twice, equaling four damage. 
The double gunner does this damage to the diagonal spaces from it, so we can use the hammer to free up some space for it. Since we have a sniper and shield bot on the board, we do more than enough damage, also netting us a hefty amount of overkill bonus points. In Act 1, the overkill currency is gold teeth. In Act 2, it's foil, and in Act 3, it's Robobox. Interesting. We go from physical money to paper money to digital money. We can use this cash to upgrade and purchase and later craft and delete cards from our deck. Now, that first battle will be the majority of my lessons regarding tactics in Act 3. I might mention some cool tips here and there, but for the most part, this playthrough, I'll be using deck building strategies from Inscription speedrunner Tom Horseman. Tom's video on Act 3 will make the most frustrating act of this game super fun, perhaps even trivial in difficulty. Now, enough high octane tactics, let's go ahead and press forward. The best defense? Other bots. You carry a spark that can uh, reactivate old bots, add them to your deck, then they fight for you. Evidently, Poe is having trouble coming up with lore and narrative reasons for why things work the way they do in their game, seemingly coming up with stuff on the spot. In my opinion, Poe has a very well-designed game. I like the five lanes instead of four, and the emphasis on lane play. In some ways, I find it a bit more satisfying than even Leshy's version of Inscription. It's a pity that there is no Endless Act 3 mod. But one thing that we can all kind of agree on is Poe's inscription kind of lacks style and flavor. Everything is sort of metallic and holographic. That being said, the bosses, or uber bots of Botopia, are quite interesting. Come to think of it, I think Poe's style is, is really his own. There are moments where he does set himself apart from the other scribes. But Poe's creativity mainly pours within the actual card mechanics. Now, I would argue that our deck is already pretty good. I have half a mind to just ignore this free card pickup, but to make things interesting, let's go ahead and choose a new card. I want to avoid picking up two cost cards so that I can always draw that energy bot in my starting hand. I really like the alarm bot. Its annoying sigil makes it so that the card in front of it does one damage, so naturally this high damage card will have a short life. Once the alarm bot is dead, that damage buff to your enemy disappears. It's very important to not put it in front of double gunners and insecto drones. This could spell out a quick loss for you. But in all of the scenarios, the alarm bot is a great, albeit short-lived way of securing an early game damage. Think of it this way. Two damage we deliver against our opponent is two damage we can tank. That's one of the things I really liked about Daniel Mullen's approach to this card game is a good offense, in a way, is always a good defense. That's extra health that you can tank before dying yourself. We explore a secret area to find some Robobucks on the floor. Getting back on the path, we find our first item. You'll need more than a few reactivated bots. That is, if you truly wish to enact the Great Transcendence. Botopia has some of the most OP items just lying around. That will recharge your energy one turn. Pretty good. If you're smart, you'll use your items liberally. You'll replenish them at a waypoint, obviously. This is a good tip. I did my best to break my chipmunking habit of never using items, and it helped a lot. If you are in a pickle, look to your items. They almost always can get you out of that pickle. I won't show the full fight, but the energy battery that fully replenishes your energy saved my butt in this next fight. We pick up a sniper bot and find our next deck building mechanic. The real best way to fight back those rogue bots Modify your guns. Give them OP abilities. Hmm. We'll come back to this later. This is a sigil enchantment module. It's super fun to use. It will generate three sigils to enchant a card of your choice. If you still want some challenge, but want the game to be manageable, I would recommend giving your energy bot unkillable. But I want to absolutely break this game, so I'm going to save this enchantment module for later. Just you wait. This strategy will involve stimulation. You're almost at the waypoint, don't choke now. This next fight has us on a bridge. I'll skip through it, but you may find it useful to know that you can use the hammer to break the bridge rails on your side. These are great places to safely put your sniper bots, because like previous acts, our opponents won't hammer their own cards. We proceed and make it to our first waypoint. You made it to the first waypoint, cool. Your items are recharged. Bots that you've destroyed in the area will stay that way. And if when you do perish, you'll be brought back here. It's an elegant system. We won't die at all in this run, don't you worry. But now that we've found our first travel point, I want to point out an interesting similarity about the map. 
It looks just like the map from the second act. It seems Poe has conquered the realm of inscription and renamed it Botopia. And perhaps they intend on taking the whole realm of inscription through this great transcendence. We move south to find a convenient spot to spend our excess Robobox. Glorious commerce. Your Robobox are accepted here. I really like this addition to Poe's inscription. Poe's inscription is notorious for being very frustrating. It feels very easy to softlock yourself at times. That's how I felt when I played this act for the very first time, and I'm not gonna lie, I was tempted to just chuck this entire game when I was initially playing it. But this is actually intentional from a narrative perspective. We just haven't gotten there quite yet. I do want to commend Poe for one thing I believe he does better than Leshy's hegemony. As we discover new means of tweaking our deck, we will have a much more easier access to them in the marketplace, and we can repeatedly purchase new upgrades. We can purchase new sigils for our cards. We can even purchase card deletion. If there's a card that's gumming up our deck, we can delete it very easily. We don't have to cross our fingers for a Bone Lord interaction. In Leshy's game, you don't get to choose what card-related events show up on your map. If you like planning around RNG and taking those opportune moments when it goes in your favor to break the game, Leshy's inscription is right up your alley. But if you're a little bit of a game theorist and like to break and tweak the game on your own volition, then Poe's inscription might be right up your alley. It truly is a pity that there is no Endless Act 3 mod. Anyways, we've got two options, move east or west. I choose West. We find a hidden area where there is a minigame where we must time the activation of a trap when a little holographic critter jumps over it. This grants us a pelt that we can use in a tarot card segment later in this act. This particular area seems to be infested with sentry bots. It's giving me Portal 2 credit scene vibes. There isn't a deranged scientist hiding among these bots, is there? We proceed back up through the main path, ignoring a free card event, and find once again our dear Sagdid mechanic Rebecca. Woof! Sorry, turn back. This bridge is totally busted. Go back! I'll need time. Beat a boss? That should give me enough time. Woof! Yep, still broken. No fixing this thing for a while. This job? Yeah, it's gonna take a minute. I bet if you defeated one of the Uber bots, I bet that would be enough time to finish it up. Woof. Note that her face is split, the other half of her face resembling the Obel. And that makes sense. The Obel is given to Charon so that you may pass into the afterlife. And if my theory that Rebecca is a Zoroastrian Sagdid is correct, and this is a perfect melding of the two concepts, the guardian of the river into the afterlife and the guardian of the bridge into the afterlife. Hmm, two into one. That's satisfying to think about, but that's not the only reason why we are here. Keep this concept of the Sagdi, the Zoroastrian concept in mind. Something has eluded me up until this point. And so instead of having to defeat scribes to proceed in this act, we must defeat uberbots. Just you wait, these uberbots will have uncanny similarities to their scribe counterparts, and we may be able to glean some floppy analysis from them. We have no choice but to go east. Eastern Botopia, not much value out this way. But you still gotta explore here, you know, for the great transcendence. South from this point, there's a hidden area, but with nothing in it. I'm assuming its purpose is to avoid the coming card battle, but I choose violence. Not much to glean from this fight, but before I skip through it, I want to showcase how the annoying sigil works. We are able to neuter our opponent's alarm bot by placing our zero damage cards in front of it. We beat our opponent, and notice our wanted level has gone up. Are you wondering about that star? You've been winning a lot. You've now got a bounty on your head. It's sure to attract bounty hunters. It resets when you die, though. Tragically, our deck will be too powerful to really feel the weight of the life of crime we're pursuing, but the bounty bots are a pretty fun addition to this act. We move north from this point, picking up some cash, and I notice a downed insectodrone, evidently zapped by a nearby pylon. Not really important, I just appreciate the post-apocalyptic set design. Post-apocalyptic. Now that's quite fitting. I want to point out the interesting sets of each act. We start in the wild, pre-civilization using bits of gold, pelts, and animal for barter. 
Then we see the dawn of civilization, literally a dawn with the rising sun, of four regions in Act 2. And now Act 3, Botopia, a desolation following Poe's attainment of the Carnaval Code, or I guess in his case, the old data. Now that's juicy. Let's keep playing. In the next fight, we meet our first bounty bot. The name's Clank Kraszki, and I'll be taking that scalp of yours. Nothing personal, kid. In these cases, just make sure you don't defeat the card in front of them, and they will never have a chance to do damage to you. These are very powerful robots. Check out this nifty chain of events. Ugh. Blunder. Actually, no, not a blunder. No, wait, there we go, yes, there we go. Nice, 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 nice. That, that was actually a pretty solid play, I think. Calculated. A cool little domino effect that clears the way for our double gunner. We make short work of this battle and another and find the waypoint to the eastern region. Items 100% charged. Bot spawners 100% offline. Ah, lame. The power is dead on this old thing. I'll let you get up if you go get me a new battery. Nice. We get to explore post factory. Let's get the blood flowing and get our steps in. You're allowed in the inspection room only. Just get me the battery from the inspectometer and come back. Again, just like in Leshy's cabin, we're dashing to fix positions, a common trope among GameWorks games. We look at Poe's card printer. This custom card will play a role in a peripheral puzzle, but that interface to the left will be the final step in the console ARG, so we will be returning. To our left, the cuckoo clock from Leshy's cabin glitches in. Ah. How annoying. The other scribe's junk sometimes glitches in here. Try to ignore it. I turn the clock to the 11 o'clock position, and instead of getting a ring like we did in Act 1, we get a card with a wing on it. This is one of three clues to a mage's pillar puzzle we will be solving. Funny enough, instead of a ring, we get a wing. A commenter pointed out that the clock may be linked to Magnificus. And this makes sense. It's adorned with these Christmas trees that look similar to Magnificus. And it's the Cuckoo Clock, where we find Magnificus's stunted wolf from Act 1. Later in this act, we will also find an Ouroboros in this clock. And that may solidify that Ouroboreal link we have with Magnificus. Remember, we see on his easel that sort of unkillable sigil Ouroboros symbol at the top of his tower. But enough floppiness, we'll keep this clue in mind. We enter the inspection room where we must solve some easy puzzles. Oh, I left those things turned off? That's fine, just solve some easy puzzles. In the second capture-like puzzle, we see some strange photos of a building. We will come to learn that these photos come from the old data. It's interesting how we must choose the boxes with cards in them, and the fact that these boxes with these photos in them are incorrect for the capture puzzle means that there are no cards in these photos in these buildings. Don't worry, we'll be able to glean some interesting information from these photos within the final parts of the main ARG of inscription. This will be in the next final video. We solve the captcha and proceed forward. There's a deactivated bot to our right. This is a camera bot that will be activated once we beat the Uberbot counterpart to Leshy. And that's fitting because in a box to our left, we find the fish bot, the angler inscribed into a tech card. Found me, good. Robot fish hide me. Revenge for last time, bad fish. We grab the battery and I am somewhat tickled that we can put it back where we left it. But alas, we must bring the battery to Poe to continue our game. Yep, that's it, bring it over. Hmm. Diverting the energy may be a security issue for Poe. We'll have to see. Before continuing, I solved some puzzles in the same spot where we solved the cabinet puzzles in Act 1. The first cabinet gives us a new item. Mrs. Bomb's remote? Sure, take it. Drops bombs in every empty space. Tactical board wipe. Don't be stupid about it. I never figured out a proper use for this item, but the second cabinet, however... Ah! Is it? Who are... Is this stimulation? Something other than darkness? Many thanks. Do with me what you will. Anything but that infinite darkness. This little whizbot will be the key in absolutely breaking Poe's game. It does a whopping two damage. Its only downside is its clinging sigil. However, there are instances we can use it to our advantage. On its own, it's a very good card, but we can make it even better. 
Now mind you, this is a two cost card, so we'll have to get rid of that energy card if we want to play the Wizbot consistently. To our right is a tablet with the rules, and just like in Act 1, it defaults to the Mighty Leap Sigil. This piping is oddly familiar. If you recall in Magnificus' washroom in Act 2, there is piping that I was puzzled as to what significance it could have. Many commenters on that video brilliantly pointed out that the Goo Mage's viscous form allows him to travel within the plumbing with relative ease, and this is confirmed within this act, but even as early as here, because occasionally there's a little Easter egg that reveals the presence of the Goo Mage. It's very easy to miss. I rifle through the rule tablet, peeping some of the new sigils and items, but I move on and we continue to trek through the eastern region of Botopia. Yep, thanks. That should do it, back to the gang. But before that, I have to soup up this lonely Wizbot card. I go back to that first free enchantment module before the first waypoint. I stand up from the table and sit back down to initiate an autosave and activate the module. I have a choice between unkillable, hefty, and energy boost. Hefty can be useful in some scenarios, but it won't fit into my strategy. And while unkillable is a phenomenal sigil for any card, it will be cancelled out by a future upgrade we'll be making to this card. I could re-roll for Bifurcated, but I do like the idea of giving the Wizbot an energy boost since it will be replacing our energy bot. I choose the energy boost sigil then make my way down to the marketplace to buy another sigil upgrade. I get lucky and get the bifurcated sigil. Even though we get lucky, I still want to demonstrate how to save scum this enchantment module. Before clicking on the upgrade module, stand up from the table and sit back down. When you click on the module and don't get the outcome you desire, promptly press escape then go back to the menu. Once there, continue your game from your autosave and it'll take you back to right before you clicked on the module. To re-roll your RNG, walk out of the area, then back in, stand up, sit down, and then try again. This is a speedrunning tactic that I learned from Horseman's video. I highly recommend it. And you can also apply it to the card pickup modules as well. I'm a bit indecisive as to what Uberbot to fight first. Firstly, I go northeast to the foul backwaters. Poe has this to say. Revolting. Yeah, sorry that you have to see this. It's the last area in Botopia that still has life in it. That stinking, squirming mass of imperfection. The set design of this region is very nature-oriented, and it seems to disgust Poe. Poe seems to like the metallic sanitized approach. Instead of a standard card battle, we stumble into something a bit more urgent. Oh no! You came at, uh, just the wrong time. This generator is about to explode, or something. You have to recharge it before that happens. It's a race against the clock, you'll see. Leshy fish is near, must fight. Other scribe fish too, deep beneath. Oh, that's very- Stimulation! Thanks, Wizbot. The angler senses the familiarity of this region. He says the scribes are deep beneath. This means the scribes weren't killed or deleted, they're just simply trapped in hiding within the waters below this game. We have 7 turns to do 11 damage. Since our lonely Wizbot is bifurcated, we can place it in front of one of these pylons with the annoying sigil and still do damage directly to PO3, or the generator in this case. And since the pylons are annoying, our damage is boosted. So now we do a whopping 6 damage per turn, making this generator segment absolutely trivial. The Wizbot alone can take this on, but for extra style points I play the Angler Bot. I am bait? I love how the angler's gun is just a giant shark gun. Whoa. We've gone from jumping the shark gun to shooting it. Wow. Great. You had charged it before it exploded. If I could clap for you, I would. This is interesting. We're avoiding a generator meltdown. Hmm. A nuclear meltdown, perhaps? This may be thematically relevant to a pet theory that I'm piecing together. Our reward for avoiding the meltdown is a free sigil module. I use it to give my fish bot the unkillable sigil. This combined with the free card on death sigil is very fun to play around with. We'll see it in play later in our exploration. I proceed further into the forest, but I get a feeling that I should instead go southeast. There is an upgrade that my Wizbot is missing that I can easily find there. Poe has this to say about this area, called the Filthy Corpse World. Ah. This dank scrapyard is pretty unpleasant. Its inhabitants' grasping claws seek fresh bots. Watch your ankles. Makes sense. The robotic version of a cemetery or mausoleum would be a scrapyard. I wonder what kind of robotic shamblers we will come across. We beat a card battle and find a hidden area. 
electrical pylons and headstones surrounding an overclocked upgrade module. This gives me Frankenstein vibes, which is fitting given the Frankenstein's monster is an amalgam of different parts. And wait a second, this is probably just a coincidence, but I can't help but notice. We stumble upon this common Frankenstein motif, and that alone makes a lot of sense. We have been stripping down, assembling, and rearranging parts and cards and whatnot, much like how Dr. Frankenstein did to assemble his monster. We want to create this super card and... Super. Hmm. Oh yeah, there's something there. Anyways, our desires to create a super card can easily parallel with Dr. Frankenstein's desire to create a superman. In my mind's eye, whenever I think of the novel Frankenstein, I always think of the painting Wanderer Above the Sea Fog. And coincidentally, a book that we'll be going over later in this video shares the same exact painting. Now, my philosophy student, Best Bud, P, as uh, we're going to call him, told me that this is probably a coincidence, but nonetheless, what am I if not a floppy uh, a whiteboardsman? Anyways, let's move on. Let's allow Poe to give us the lowdown on overclocking our cards. I'll overclock one of your cards, give it an attack buff, but if it dies, it's gone forever. So now our Wizbot does a whopping six damage. That's six damage we can do on turn two. The only caveat is that if we don't happen to win the game on that turn, the Wizbot will be in danger. Done. Don't let it die. It only has one health, and if it dies, it will be deleted from our deck. If this were just any card, I wouldn't be too spooked about it, but this is the Lonely Wizard, a voiced and ensouled card. The stakes are high, the pork loins are stoned, and the chicken cutlets are baked. But this upgrade will ultimately trivialize the game, making a once frustrating act into a cakewalk, a muffin jug, a scone saunter. Sorry. I commit to further exploring the southeastern scrapyard to see what kind of deathly uberbot awaits at the end. In one battle, we face another bounty bot. Oh, honey, don't cry. I'm Blast Van Gun. I'll make it swift. But our lonely whizbot is just too sick with it. There's a shortcut blocked by ice. Perhaps we'll be meeting Casey, the ghoul, soon. We meet our first death-related robot cards, exoskeletons. Painful, but ultimately fleeting damagers. So much to see! I play suboptimally and drop a verbal banger. Nice, okay, perfect. That was a really good play. Ooh, but can we? Shall we? Mm, poopy. But eventually, Team Fishmulation, ooh, that sounds f weird, takes home the W and we move forward, meeting a cybernetic version of Casey the Ghoul. She clears the way for us, opening up a shortcut to the entrance of this region. <sighs> you wish to pass this ice? Well, I suppose I could clear it. A little bit of heat should do the trick. <laughs> Ooh, that's dark. Poe seems to laugh at some sort of dark irony to Casey the Ghoul needing a bit of heat. This ultimately foreshadows a bit of information that we will learn about the demise of Casey Hobbs. Remember, we first meet Casey as a death card in Act 1. This next event is very helpful if you have some pesky two-cost cards you'd like to get rid of. I'm not the traitor or anything, but there's gonna be a little give and take here. You'll have to trade one of your cards for one of these. We give Poe our energy bot for a three cost Skelelatcher, so now we will draw the powerful Lonely Wizbot on our first hand every battle, ultimately trivializing all regular card battles and even most of the Uberbot battles. It's interesting that we are still coming to these sort of cyclical give and take themes. Even this deep into our investigation, they still almost elude me. Obviously, Poe has his version of the give and take, the cyclical give and take of his trade segment, his version of the traitor in Leshy's inscription. But even in his own boss fight in Act 2, his conveyor belt is a sort of square kind of cycle. His larger factory is a cycle, an ouroboreal cycle of assembly and disassembly, consuming the tail and generating the tail. Leshy is all about the cycle of life and death. Poe is all about assembly and disassembly. And so we have an organic regurgitation and an inorganic regurgitation. I feel like I'm playing favorites here, so I give my fishbot a touch of death sigil with the discounted sigil module. Three abilities? Hm, decent. We cross the bridge towards the Uberbot's temple and get into another battle. 
<laughs> Play me! Here's an interesting instance of the clingy sigil on the lonely Wizbot used to our benefit. Check this out. So the Insecta drone's coming around this way, right? I'm gonna put this here. Lonely Wizbot's gonna move here. Boom. Oh, what does it matter? Okay, oh, yeah, perfect. So then, yeah, this beats us. Yeah, there we go. Boom, boom, and we win. We secure another waypoint right outside the Uberbots. Wait, Uberbot? Uber. Uber. That's German. Uber. Wait a second. I'm suddenly reminded of that lyric that eluded me in the hex. I wish I were more like the Ubermensch. I wish my fear didn't leave such a stench. Ooh, fear. You have nothing to fear but your own inadequacy. That's a quote by Leshy. Hmm. But nonetheless, there's that mention of an Ubermensch. Ubermensch. Uberbot. All you philosophy students already know where I'm going with this. What a depressing abode. You have to be here to defeat the resident Uberbot, but I don't think you'll want to stay long. I give this Galilatra an overclock in hopes that I could eventually hammer it to permanently delete it from my deck. This is a creative example of how we the player can trim the fat from our deck. We move to the right where Sawyer Patel stood in the second act to see that the staircase leading down into the Bone Lord's mausoleum has been replaced by a corridor. We go forward, elude a bounty bot. Gear Van Grind reporting for duty. My mission, eliminate target. After that, maybe start a small business, a bed and breakfast, something nice. Settle down, find a partner, manufacture some children. Grow old, pass the business onto my children, rest away content with my life's work, surrounding my family. But first, eliminate target. How many, how many, how many accents? That was, I think I cycled through like several accents. Boom, boom. Mega da mega damage. The Carnaval Code. And I noticed something in the room preceding the Bone Lord's abode. Ah ha ha ha. Two coins. Two sides to the opal. And we go through the door. Where did you get that? With the key given to us by the Bone Lord in Act 2, we unlock a door and meet the Bone Lord one last time. You found me here, so you wish to know more. I have meditated deeply on the old data. I will impart my insights, but you mustn't record them. Creepy. We give Luke Carter and the Bone Lord their privacy. What the fuck, man? That is everything I know. Holy shit! Based on the despair in Luke's voice and even PO3 shock, it seems the Bone Lord has imparted some sort of forbidden knowledge. It's in this room where a key aspect of the ARG is located. It seems we have witnessed Luke stumbling a bit too far down this rabbit hole, and in this moment, it seems to have gotten to him. I'll be honest, I'm not 100% certain what kind of knowledge the Bone Lord would have imparted upon Luke that would give him such a scare. One thing that came to mind when writing this was that maybe the Bone Lord revealed or implied that Luke Carter was a character in a video game and thus he had a sort of existential crisis. Or less floppily, the Bone Lord, spoiler alert, alluded to Luke's untimely demise. However, one thing that's far more concrete is that the fact that the Bone Lord couldn't say it on camera must imply that this has something to do with the Carnoffel Code. Perhaps it's at this point when Luke canonically started his rabbit hole, his spiraling into trying to discover what this Carnoffel Code is, what all data lies within this floppy disk. I want to apologize. In my footage collection of the ARG element in this cutscene, I may have screwed with the gamma settings. The contrast is a bit messed up from here on out. If it doesn't look too bad, then that must mean I fixed it in post. But just a heads up if there are any brightness quirks with my game footage because of this blunder. After being cognito hazarded by the Boner Lord, we head towards the Uberbot's abode and are stopped by a pair of robotic librarians. Halt, we require a commitment to pass. You must agree to grant access to the Archivist. Do you agree to grant access? It is important. You must sign this contract. Oh, you cannot sign this contract. You do not have a writing utensil. 
These are hooded ghouls holding files, asking access to our computer's hard drive. Pair that with the fact that their one eye is being covered, they have a creepy grin, and even spider-like limbs protruding from their back, being totally sado-coded, we might be dealing with something more sinister than we realize. Keep this in mind for when we analyze the design of the Uberbot of this region, the Archivist. We need a quill to write with, so we go to the left and enter where the trader was in Act 2, having to make a trade with Poe to access this room. Here we fittingly trap another holopelt, and proceed to the room where Grimora's well was in Act 2. Note that the crank on this well looks a lot like the crank on Poe. What this means, I'm not sure. Perhaps this is also a callback to the Game Jam game, Keep It Alive, from Daniel Mullins my all-time favorite of his Game Jam games. Seriously, I wish he made a full version of it. The rail workers in that game kind of remind me of the angler, even using hooks to get into the train. Probably a coincidence. We draw a quill from the well and some extra cash, if we draw a second time. Funny. We draw water from a well, draw like drawing cards. We take the quill and bring it to the librarians to sign over the rights to access our hard drive. You have brought a fine quill. Please sign here that you agree to give access. Thank you. Do not forget your agreement. Right before facing the boss, we find another waypoint. So if we lose this fight, we'll be sent back to the room right before it. That's quite forgiving. It's interesting. In Leshy's game, a game over means the end of a run. If you spent 15 minutes strategizing and building up a deck, those 15 minutes are gone. You have to start fresh. Whereas in Poe's inscription, it's quite merciful. The only thing you lose is money, and even then, you just go back to where you died and pick up the money. In nature, death is a common occurrence. Whereas in the age of technology, we have means of cheating death, be it medicine or a drone carrying you out of danger into safety. We face the Uberbot, surrounded by librarians. This is the archivist. There it is, the Uberbot you saw it. These idiotic librarians worship it, as it sits here covered in filth and grime, ready to clean it up. I tried to see if the static on the archivist's face was spelling anything out in Morse. The first four characters I was able to translate were I4VG, but it's hard to discern what is a pause between these blinks. I don't think it's spelling anything out, but I wonder what others have found. Maybe I just didn't translate right. Morse code does come into play, so we'll be keeping this means of translating in mind. Oh look, it's boss time. Unpacking archivist.zip. Applying personality matrices. Cleaning up some temp files. Okay, here we go. Ah, oh, greetings. If you had not gleaned it from my title of my zip file, I am the archivist. I eagerly await the opportunity to explore your hard drive. Files and directories are my specialty, you see. So many files! So much stimulation! Oh boy, there's a lot to unpack here. Notice the archivist has one eye covered by a strand of hair, hair made of ones and zeros. This is very similar to Sato. On top of that, the eyelashes are very similar, with the eye and pupil being identical to Sato when she has her crazed activated eye. The markings on the cheek of the archivist resemble both Sato and Gromoro's cheek markings. The Archivist itself is located in the southeast of the map, just like Grimora, and both have themes regarding death and memoriam. Now hold on, do the markings on the cheeks of the Archivist remind you of anybody else? Hopeless Soul from Pony Island. On second thought, that's a bit of a stretch, at least from this perspective. However, there are some pretty dang good links that we can make between Hopeless Soul and Grimora. This is just one of those floppier sources of inspiration for what I do think is a less floppy connection. In Pony Island, Hopeless Soul's desktop password is 2734. In the ARG segment of the hex, that third cipher, if I'm not mistaken, third cipher that's associated with Sado has the numbers 2734 and 666 in it. Grimora as the stink bug in act one is trapped inside of a safe the, to unlock that safe is 273. That number will be coming up once again in the ARG for this game. So what do all these vague connections mean? Does that mean that Grimora, Sado, and the Hopeless Soul are all the same character? Probably not. There is some overlap though. 
especially between the Hopeless Soul and Grimora. If I really wanted to stretch, there could be some sort of overlap between Sado's misanthropic sadism and Grimora's more pessimistic nihilism. But I think the real goal, the real nougaty crunch, is going to be within Hopeless Soul's comparison. In Pony Island, Hopeless Soul carried a positive rapport with the player. The player plays the game and ultimately, at least according to my theory, the player inadvertently set Hopeless Soul, a cyber demon, along with a bunch of other demon souls, free from hell. If we were to interpret that stampede of ponies at the finale of Pony Island as to be demons escaping from hell, then that final cutscene with the pony flying over the dead body of Theodore, or dying body of Theodore, winking at him, is a lot more sinister than we might have realized initially. Could we parallel that interaction with Grimora's interactions with the player? Not you and I the player, but Luke the player. Now if the end result of Pony Island is to unleash demons on Earth, what would be the end result of Grimora's machinations and inscription? Well, I'll give you a hint. Look at the shape of her head. This could potentially at least symbolically spell out what her true intentions are. And I'll tell you this, it has nothing to do with bunt cakes. There's a hole in this kick. That's a deep cut. Put some Windex on that. The Archivist is pretty simple to deal with. Anytime we defeat one of its librarians, we'll have an opportunity to choose a file. Oh, I should have inquired sooner. You will need to grant me access to your hard drive. Would you please acquiesce? I assure you, no harm will come of it. That's funny. We aren't able to select no. We see similar scenarios where yes or no questions really don't matter. Like when Lucifer is fixing Pony Island and asks us to wait, or when Reginald asks us if we were satisfied with the Hex's ending. Seriously, this pattern weaving that Daniel Mullins does makes my brain feel real good. One more thing. That Morse code in the background. In the music. It spells Big Ear. This is one of several answers we'll be seeking in the Hex's ARG. Anyways, we grant access to the Archivist. Here comes your actual files. I hope no one is watching. Now, do recommend an exemplary file to me, and do take into account its size, its magnitude, its bulk. We choose a file, but from our computer. Now this is interesting, this should be Luke's computer files. Why is it showing ours? Until now we have canonically been a viewer of footage. We are supposed to take the gameplay as Luke's gameplay, right? Stay tuned, this detail is a subtle foreshadowing. We will be exploring Luke's hard drive in the console ARG later in this video. Giving it PonyIsland.exe gives us this dialogue. That poor soul, how sad. Not surprising, the archivist sympathizes with the hopeless soul perhaps indicating another link between the two. The more storage a file takes up, the more damage it does. Executables aren't known for being hefty, so it nets us only two damage. Giving it the hex.exe, the archivist says, Lionel wanted what? This references the line, Lionel wants this, when Irving, the GameWorks assistant, broke the legs of game dev Lionel Snill's first creation, Reginald. Hmm. The Morse code is saying Big Ear. That's the nickname of Barry Reginald Wilkerson. Reginald, Root Beer Reggie. I don't know. Fascinating to think about. There's a lot of really cool thematic interactions between the Hex and Pony Island. If you liked this series and haven't watched those videos, I think you'd really like them. I'm very proud of the coverage of those two games. I try giving the Archivist sacrifices must be made, but no dice. I believe we've explored the extent of the Archivist Easter eggs, at least on the PC version. There's a whole nother can of worms in the console version of this game, and don't worry, we'll get into it later in this video. The next file I give it is the final render of my Who's Lila video, a whopping 41 gigabytes. Look at that satisfying creation date, by the way, 112223. I'm not sure what the text size indicates, maybe file size, but the thing is, the Inscription Chapter 2 final draft is less gigs than my Who's Lila, final draft, but the text is bigger, so I'm not sure what it indicates. After giving the archivist some more of my video footage, I do enough damage to enter the second phase of the boss. Please select a file. This one, however, is very special. Choose a file that is dearest to your heart, and one that shows age. 
In the second phase, we start off by choosing another file, but this time we're choosing file age rather than size. Now, I'm very lucky. My lapel mic's internal clock isn't up to date, so the audio file's dates are set back to 2016. Thank you, Tascam. The files that are particularly old are dark and faded, with the file icon being decayed. Here's the problem with selecting audio files. All right, audio on. This is green screen inscription two, part one. Video on, inscription, part one. Green screen. <laughs> you can hear me burping. <laughs> So you've chosen to subject me to this racket. Enough. That's embarrassing, but it's also funny, so I'll leave it in. I wonder what kind of files Luke's has on his computer. Now let us place that file in a card. You didn't choose a file that was too dear, did you? For if this card dies, I will delete the file from your disk. Please do not tempt me. I am completely serious. Shall we see what that looks like? Hold on a minute. Why is the file holding a gun to its head? The archivist says it's seen things. Being that this is an old file, literal old data, is there something about the old data that invokes a similar response? I don't think so, but I will say this. The theme of taking one's life will come up once again and have something to do with the initial acquiring of the Carnoffel code. We've exhausted this uberbot far enough. Let's go ahead and finish off the archivist. I thought I had you. Oh well. You've made a few correct deck building decisions, I guess, and you're lucky. I love how unclimactic the boss fights are when they end. It's so sudden. Now let's take a look at the Uberbot now that we've defeated it. It's got a beam of ones and zeros emerging from its head, and the emerging beam of ones and zeros emerging from its associated tablet thingy. Very similar to Act 2. But this light beam head flung back positioning is what I would imagine a transcended robot would look like. Where is the archivist transcending to? What plane of existence? Good morning. Creator? Steward? What do you prefer? Don't type, just say. It's strange to call myself a creator. I'm not the ocean, just the river that stewards the font. Or a channel, perhaps? No, that's the other one. I know. I'm very keen on these things. But the other three will see you and think you're somebody else. All we do here is describe the stars. But if you want to prove yourself, you'll have to connect the stars. Find the patterns. Do what you do best. Find me when you're ready to jump back into the water and finish this once and for all. You remind me a lot of that peacock in the church, toiling for the sake of toiling, sacrificing your own flesh as if it's a virtue of itself. When's the last time you've exercised, taken your health into consideration? Don't you realize there is no description if you've wasted away? I'll get to it eventually. Maybe when this place can sustain itself. That will never happen. This boulder will never reach its peak, and you're getting weaker as you push it. Let me show you some muscle building techniques. Strengthen your flesh. Thank you. I don't think this is necessary for the kind of gameplay we'll be seeing here, but I appreciate it, Meathead. Why have you returned? Are you going to shovel me off into another hackneyed plot? Another half-baked skit? Frame me in some poorly animated video game facade? Get behind me, Satan! The scene opens with a foul, cravenous, robed man. I've met few in my time here, but only one comes to mind. Gary Miller. How do you respond? Father Ward. He's the one who ultimately defeated the Unholy Trinity. I like your hope and faith. How about some Caritas? I'll let you play another character. Then Father Garcia with his beatific buckshot. Very good. 
Keeping with the theme of foul, cravenous men, how about Low Shoulder, that boy band? I'll let you describe. In a dank dive bar, a band of four musicians enter the fray. Across from them, trees rise from the ground. Needy Les Nicky faces them with a knife, the same knife they use to victimize Jennifer Check. These characters canonically defeat yours. I win! Noble Jennifer Check. <laughs> Your JV tactics won't work on me, pretender. We always think about the cathartic comeuppance of the victimizers, but never the victims. If you really were who you posed to be, you would have been with them in the garden, weeping alongside of them. I like my odds, pretender. Do you? I don't know about my odds. I don't even get the rules of this game of description, but I'm noticing a pattern here. What? The dark feminine. Seems what we are describing shows an affinity for stories of feminine characters falling to some sort of predatory force. The darkness then cultivates, and while that darkness festers, it eventually overtakes the malicious due to bravery. A forlorn one, but bravery nonetheless. Jennifer Check and Amy Martin, Needy and Father Ward. It's connected. It rhymes. I can see it. But it's flawed. Flawed. Floppy, even. Do we really stare up at the same stars every night and think we are telling new stories every time? I don't know, Peacock. I'm not a creator, just a describer. We pick up some cash and get to add a sigil to our empty vessels. Remember your side deck? That useless thing with all the empty vessels? It's about to get less useless. Oh yeah, that's satisfying. One more time, please. Your pick will be installed on every empty vessel card. All these are solid choices. I end up choosing the Mighty Leap Sigil, so now my vessels can tank damage from Insecto Drones and other flying cards, making my early game all the more viable. Walking away from the Archivist, Luke's camcorder pauses recording due to full memory. We are back in our found footage segment. I want to take this moment to correct a previous error I made in my last video. I assumed that Verk was a common German suffix. I should have said word part, since suffix exclusively means the latter end of a word. I made this sort of large generalization because of the German band Kraftwerk and the word Schwerkkraft, meaning gravity, a word I first came across in Suspiria. That bit of data was enough for me to assume, yep, it's a common suffix in German. In my research for what the word Werk could mean in camwork, I come to find out that Werk is a factory or plant in German. There's Werkzeug, Urwerk, Laufwerk. These are German words. So here is my more complete summation of the Camwerk's name. Cam, obviously, is short for camera or camcorder. However, the K that's used to spell Camwerk's could imply a double meaning with the character Kaminsky. A character we'll come to learn is of Polish nationality and is the owner or founder of the company Kaminsky Data Storage. Kaminsky and his company Kaminsky Data Storage will be more relevant in the ARG in the next video. So is Kaminsky and Kaminsky Data Storage somehow tied to the CAM works simply because of the letters K-A-M in CAM works? One could think that's just a mere coincidence. After all, the CAM works has a more stronger linking to the game works, which is a game Funa property. But why not consider that all of these entities and companies are tied to game Funa in some way as a parent company? Sony makes game systems, cameras, and even flash drives and memory sticks, data storage. Why not game Funa? So let's consider the linking between all these companies, not necessarily in this video, but in the next video when we really break down the ARG and the larger world outside of the floppy disk and outside of that camcorder, the game that we have been playing. It will help us make sense of the conspiratorial assembling of the data that exists on this floppy disk. But my apologies. Let's piece together some found footage. On October 2nd, quite a while ago, we see some footage of Luke in his car after purchasing the inscription vintage packs from the garage sale. He mentions that he feels a bit guilty for the steal he got them for, but noted that since the lady he bought it from lived in a nice neighborhood, she may not be hurting for cash. Big pack opening video incoming! Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo! Super floppy mode, but let's get the mind churning. Why was the wealth of this garage saleswoman mentioned? Why is a wealthy individual selling these cards? We will return to this shortly. I would like this 
theory of mind to be revealed in its own natural way. You needn't keep this in mind for very long. On October 16th, well into Luke's delving deep into the mystery of the floppy disk, we see him anticipating a phone call to the lady he purchased the packs from. Note the framed cards to his right. This is a subtle hint to a totally different card game that will play a role in the ARG and Luke's own backstory. It belongs to a set of Aqua Romans, an empire-themed sea creature card set conceptualized by Daniel Mullins way back in the day. This is a cherished card to Luke. Later in this act, it will be revealed that this is the last memory he has of a loved one, or say last memorabilia, of his sister Elle. I reveal this now because there is a sad mirror forming here. In this phone call, it is revealed the inscription cards belong to the garage saleswoman's daughter. This daughter has passed away a while ago, and her name was Casey, and she worked on inscription for Game Funa. Link's inquiry is cut short out of respect since Mrs. Hobbs is having dinner at the moment. Imagine the kindred pain both Luke and Miss Hobbs share. Miss Hobbs evidently needed to let go of the past and sell the late Casey's inscription memorabilia. We will very soon learn this could be because of Casey's death being tied to her work on inscription and for game Funa. And in the reflection of that mirror, we see Luke still holding onto this card that's his last memory of his late sister Elle, the sister of whom he shared so many tabletop memories with. The footage ends abruptly and glitch-like. Okay. Alright, have a good dinner. Note that in the previous footage, we see Luke reach for the camcorder's record button to stop the footage. And here it seems to have started and stopped on its own. He is being watched by the cam works, the game works, game Funa, Amanda, not sure. This next clip is on the same day. I'll go ahead and let the footage speak for itself. Articles mention death or injury. No one was killed at the facility, though tragically young video game developer Casey Hobbs died from fire-related complications. Fire off. She was working late at the facility, performing quality assurance on behalf of her employer, Game Funa. Before going into the whiteboard segment, note that we see a very distinctive eye within the static, focused right on Luke. This does remind me of Sato's crazed eye, but it's a bit reptile-like, almost like a dragon. We will see Sato's eye distinctly come up within this found footage segment, so for this reason, I think this eye belongs to a different character. It's fitting that with the utterance of Game Funa's name, this demonic eye is called forth. This might be the eye of Lunatus, CEO of Game Funa, but it's anybody's guess. Also, note again, this record is initiated not by Luke, but by a mysterious force. And before it abruptly shuts off, Luke notices it's recording, confused. And sorry, one more thing. The static in this part looks interesting. I see distinctive shapes and letters, but I can't glean anything of note. Anyways, let's get floppy. First, let's go over what we know. Casey Hobbs was working on inscription when a fire broke out at the Game Funa facility, and the injuries from that fire ultimately killed her. The defibrillator failed. Remember that line from Act 2 on Casey Hobbs' epitaph? Well, now that's got me thinking. The fire failed to kill her. She could have survived. So perhaps some meddling was involved to keep her silent, to keep her dead. Mm, this smells like a cover-up. Going back to the epitaph, if that is an accurate depiction of the date of her death, then that would imply that she, of course, died in 1992. This is when the fire took place. However, if the Act 2 epitaphs are mere Easter eggs within the universe, and not accurate to the actual date of Casey's death, we at least know it happened a while ago. In the time of Luke's story, she purchases Casey's pack of vintage inscription cards from her mother. And we will also come to find out in the next video within Casey's mod that it was Casey Hobbs who buried the floppy disk in the forest, which was ultimately found by Luke, as seen in the found footage of Act 1. And remember, within this pack of cards that Luke purchased from her mother at the garage sale, Casey wrote coordinates to this buried floppy disk, fittingly on a skeleton card. Now, let's rewind. Why did Daniel Mullins want us to know about the wealth of Casey's mother? Is that just a throwaway line that was written in the script? Well, based on the data that we can glean from these three clips, I have a theory that Game Funa paid Mrs. Hobbs 
a healthy sum of hush money, a sort of settling out of court cover-up situation to sweep up the malpractice that led to Casey Hobbs's unfortunate demise. Now, is this important to the grand story of inscription? Not exactly, but I think it helps at least explain the breadth of power and the depths that Game Funa is willing to go to to try and find that Carnoffle code, that floppy disk. Now, nonetheless, I think it's helpful that we took this small whiteboard excursion to help kind of prime our minds for the next video when we really make sense of the whole timeline. This next footage is very cool. Luke is knee deep at this point in his investigation of the Carnoffle code. There are two moments we see that demonic eye in the static again. On the top sticky note, we see the phrase mirror Rorim, Rorim being mirror spelt backwards. This is the name of the Mirror Tentacle card. Not sure if this comes up again. However, this was used as an unintended clue within the ARG. What is an intended clue is the four sticky notes at the bottom of the monitor. Pig 3K Pig, or Boar 3K Boar. The only boar I can think of is the Douse. So we are to interpret this as Douse 3K Douse, or 2 3K2. This will come up again in the ARG, and we will see one more sticky note in this found footage segment that gives us our first step in the ARG. Mind you, a step we won't be taking in this video. And my favorite aspect of this video is the website he's researching on. I'm sure hundreds of fans were able to figure this out, but I was very happy when I went out on a limb and looked at the Carnoffel Wikipedia page to find a perfect match. So what this scene is telling us is Luke is using the Carnoffel game and its rule set to piece together a sequence of cards. These cards will translate to Douse, Mantis card, Rat King, and Douse. Luke shuts off the video and the recording ends. The next clip is an error, and the clip after takes place on October 17th. I believe this is past midnight, shortly after those previous clips. We will come to learn that at least the first part of the finale of this game, but also maybe the ending, takes place on October 17th. Nonetheless, this clip still vexes me. Someone is here. Fuck this. My phone's in the other room, so if I die before I can call 911, use this tape as evidence. It just ends like that. But we can glean some interesting stuff here. But first, let's look at the next clip. Within the glitch footage, Luke finds a sticky note. Written on the sticky note is mycologist, perhaps, and blood letter box, separated with those lines that we saw in the Hex's cipher base ARG. This is the first cipher puzzle to Inscription's ARG. The way he approaches it gives off the vibe that it was left there for him. Also, by the way, this gives off major Marble Hornets vibes. What a great series. So, what can we glean from this sparse footage? Well, his home is being intruded, and that sticky note, a hint, is left for him by either Amanda or Sado. The reason I suggest Sado is because of the final clip. Luke, with the first step of the cipher, has begun his delving into seeking the old data, the Carnoffel code, and he's gone insane, at least for the moment. Now, we don't see any other instances of the Carnoffel code or old data making people go crazy. Obsessive, sure, but not broken, not like this, no. The only other time we've ever seen anybody get mind F to this extent was in the hex by none other than Aha! Bingo. And also fucking terrifying. Holy shit. Sado. This is the eye of Sado. And here's the crazy thing. Luke doesn't seem to remember this night. He doesn't mention it in the final scene when going over the various trespasses of Game Funa. This hypnotic memory erasure is totally Sado coded. <laughs> coded. And this easy to miss hint, in my opinion, confirms this. Now, here's the thing. I don't think Amanda would want Luke to have discovered the contents hidden on the floppy disk, especially if we take her word that she was sent by Game Funa. 
but sealing Luke's fate, sending him down a rabbit hole that could not be good for him in hopes of unveiling the Carnoffel Code and potentially sending the world into chaos is totally what Sado, the sadistic clown hidden within the game works, would want. Sorry if I jumped the gun there a little bit regarding the dire implications of the Carnoffel Code, I just couldn't risk putting off this realization. It's very key, and nonetheless I'll be unveiling my theory of the Carnoffel Code very soon. With the found footage segment fully explored, we continue with our gameplay. We have an overpowered, overclocked, overstimulated Wizbot in our deck. So it's time we put the other key we found in Act 2 to use. Remember, this map is based off of the Act 2 map of inscription, so the mycologist hut should be right around here. The midway point between the eastern Uberbots. Now this area is purple, the merging of the colors blue and red, two into one. We place the mycologist key into the lock, and this happens. Where did you get that? What is this? This is not one of Botopia's uberbots. Where did these repugnant mushrooms come from? What is the strange feeling? I love this boss fight. The light jump scare, the possession of Poe's robotic body, the sudden mushrooms that grow. Oh buddy, we'll get into that. And to tie it all together, the mycologists look like Chevy Chase. But in reality, I think this is Daniel Mullins. We have gained control of the robot. Complete control. We must now experiment. We must play a card game. Good. Two in one. Two in one. The bots are slammed together to create a strange amalgam. The card art itself depicts what looks like limbs protruding from a mass of a cube and a circular shape. A bit of steam or smoke is sizzling from that circle. It kind of reminds me of the bell on the table if you were to look down from a bird's eye view. And of course, two mushrooms grow from the mass. So two things slam together and mushrooms form. Ringing any bells yet? No? Maybe a douse can ring that bell for us. But first, let's savor this fight. At the start of the second phase, an explode bot and alarm bot are merged together. Two in one. Two in one. So hold on. In the beginning, a leap bot and an alarm bot are merged together, and now an explode bot and an alarm bot. Something is propelled into the air as alarms start to blare, and while I'm not sure what the second alarm bot could symbolically indicate, maybe it's 2-1 stat line rhymes with a 2 into 1 theme, but the explode bot is pretty on the nose. This has something to do with explosions. We make short work of this phase, and then... Could it be? It is! Our experiments paid off! They did! It appears to be a fragment of the old data. We must study it. The robot must forget. A gem detonator and the douse are merged together, and just like before, mushrooms follow. Or in other words, mushroom clouds. What we have witnessed is the symbolic launching and detonating of an atomic bomb, and because this exact sequence was performed by the mycologist, the merged cards reveal a bit of the old data, a bit of the Carnoffel code. Now while this would be used in our own exploration of the ARG, this would be the prime indicator of the true nature of the Carnoffel code, a bit of data that could be used to wipe out all of humanity with nuclear bombs. Remember when the woodcarver said, inscription the good? No. Maybe this was the woodcarver telling us that she doesn't think that the efforts of gleaning from and inscribing from the Carnoffel Code can be used for good. It's still a hot debate today whether or not it's safe or wise to extract power from nuclear energy. Technology once used for evil now being used for good. Inscription the good. But that's floppy. What's not floppy is the clear theme here. Two into one. The mushroom theme of the mycologist perfectly rhymes with the shape of the clouds that follow nuclear detonation. And on the topic of mushroom-shaped things, look at the top of Grimora's head! 
It makes total sense that the scribe who wants to use the Carnoffel code to delete everything, annihilate all life on this disk, would be modeled after that mushroom cloud. But of course, not all want to use said power for annihilation. No, no. Leshy and Poe use this payload to achieve power, a hegemony. To use the utter asymmetry of having a card inscribed from the old data to subjugate all other scribes, or in other words, reign powerful over all other nations. One could argue what makes a world powerful so powerful is their stockpile of nuclear weapons. At least this was the idea during the Cold War. But you see, two into one, there is a flaw in my theory. The little boy, that's the name of the bomb, that was dropped on Hiroshima was a fission bomb. So instead of two into one, it was more one into two into four into 16, etc. The way fission bombs work, simply put, is f a free neutron collides into uranium, causing a chain reaction that is the nuclear explosion. That explosion is the release of energy within that uranium, I don't know, isotope, atom? I don't know what they call it. Now that kind of gels with the style of slamming two things together, two into one. If I'm not mistaken, the little boy was actually a trigger mechanism. So it was uranium slamming into free neutrons. Almost like instead of shooting a target, the target is launched at the bullet. So there is that sort of slamming two into one together, but ultimately we are talking about two into one, fusion the hydrogen bomb, a far more destructive and efficient evolution of the technology that cruelly ravaged Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I believe the mycologist boss fight is hinting to us that the Carnoffel code, the data hidden within that floppy disk has something to do with the fusion bombs. Technology, if gotten into the wrong hands, could wipe out all life on Earth. Now, I've come to learn that at this point, long after the game's release, this realization of mine isn't exactly novel. Casey's mod will ultimately confirm the world-ending nature of the Carnoffel Code. But mind you, Casey's mod wasn't released until after the release of Inscription. So for some time, this boss fight with the mycologist would have been the biggest, albeit subtle, hint as to the true nature of the Carnoffel Code. It's a bit of a belated discovery, but I'm very proud of myself that I came to this conclusion on my own. And who knows, maybe this detail of the mycologist fight mimicking the concept of a nuclear bomb is something that eluded a lot of the fan base. And perhaps that is why Daniel Mullen saw it fit to add some more clear confirmations within the later released Casey's mod update. So even if this isn't a huge discovery, I only hope that some of you are like, what? I didn't notice that. I feel terrible. What have you done to me, Challenger? Never return to this place. I really need to clean my registry. Before moving on, I want to point out the background of the old data fragment, changing into a mysterious photo. Using the ARG mechanics and a program called Asset Studio, we'll be able to examine this image, as well as other mysterious images we saw in Act 2. For now, let's press forward. As a reward, we get the merged cards on our side of the board, an amalgam made of various cards, but in particular, the sigils of the Wizbot survived. So now we have two busted overclocked cards as two costs. So if one of them dies and is removed from our deck, we will have another one to rely on. To protect these cards, I buy a new item, Nano Armor. When used, it gives all of our cards on our side of the board armor that tanks any amount of damage before breaking, just like the Shield Bot. We also buy a Hollow Pelt. You actually bought that hollow pelt? It's worthless. Take it to the trader and you'll see. Poe mocks our purchase. We'll get access to the trader later in this video, but for now, let's explore the foul backwaters, the Batopia equivalent to Leshy's forest. Since we beat the archivist, we may find some stray files of Luke's throughout the map. The one we find in the foul backwaters dates to June 6, 2006. Hmm, 6606. Found this old picture of when Elle and I first got into opera romans. Gilly Gladiator. Sick. Elle got a Julius C star. This will be a clue to a part of the ARG, the Aqua Romans card set. But more importantly right now, this is our first time hearing of Elle. I didn't think the archivist would dig up this file. 
I already mentioned this already, but might as well give the enigmatic loved one of Luke L her due. This is hardly even a minor keep in mind, but out of respect, let's keep L in mind. But I, but while we're here, I mean L, what an interesting name, right? Elohim, God. It's interesting to think about maybe L, L is dead, God is dead, the whole Nietzschean quote. Ah, no, actually, no, that's floppy. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> After fighting some animal-themed robots, we bump into the prospector. This here big of gold. I was just about to mine it. Guess all I needed were a kick in the pants. So just like with Casey the ghoul, we unlocked a shortcut going back to the entrance. Nothing too special, but I like the little holographic gold ores. It makes me want to mine them and flip them at the Grand Exchange. Just kidding, I'm Iron Man all day. We interact with the beast module, and this is pretty cool, but sadly since our deck is already so nuts, we won't really see much play out of this. We can give a card of our choice the ability to transform every turn into either a wolf, bird, or snake. It's cool to see that despite their differences, Poe has included some themes from Leshy's game into this. We beat another battle, and Poe monologues about Leshy. The guy who used to live here was totally sloppy. I don't mean he didn't keep a clean cabin, it was his plays. He'd make misplays left and right, cared more about lore and flavor. You were right to try and replace him. This is one of the more explicit appraisals the game gives of its own creators, spelling out to us the flavor-oriented style of game design to Leshy, juxtaposed with the sheer card play mechanics of Poe. We find a hidden path to another hollow pelt. On the topic of secrets, I want to show a really cool one. While we are in the foul backwaters, if we stand up from the table, go into the inspection room, and face away from the puzzle on the far left, we will see this creepy scene. Whoa. Holy shit. The woodcarver has this strange link to Leshy, featured as one of his masks in Act 1, hidden away in his forest in Act 2, and showing up when the player is in the foul backwater in this little easter egg. It makes sense in a broad way. She carves wood, and the mythology of the actual Leshy creature is heavily linked to the forest, meaning of the forest or of the woods. In a way, she's a sort of proto-scribe, but instead of inscribing onto cards, she inscribes onto wood. Which wood turns into the pulp that makes the paper on the cards. You know, I, I, don't, I didn't have this written down, but this is not, this is not even floppy. This is almost headcanony, but it's something, there's this somberness to the woodcarver, and her being this proto-inscriber onto wood, this material, this essence that becomes the cards that are inscribed onto, she almost seems like this ancient, maybe a god of a way, powerless to influence the scribes on earth using their free will to fight each other. This is why she has such a somber outlook of the old data, this thing that sort of led the children astray. And mind you, this is the only floppy disk that has the Carnoffel code and old data on it. So I really wonder what role the woodcarver would have played in like the original vision of inscription. But this is a, that's a little aside, a little bit of a break, a little bit of a, a floppy breather. Let's move on. We trade cards, beat a battle, and find ourselves at the waypoint of the foul backwaters Uberbot. The Uberbot for this area is fittingly called the Photographer. Eerie. This Uberbot just sits here in perfect darkness. Is it just waiting for challengers? Maybe it's letting its photos develop. The next boss is pretty cool. You'll actually need to think about your plays. Whole new mechanic. Okay, where were those files? Unpacking photographer.zip. My lens is my instrument. You as well are my instrument. You will aim and I will capture. The circle of light that makes up the photographer's lens is made into six sections. This reminds me a lot of the hex, and those rotating circles remind me of the visuals from the hex ritual. Fittingly, this uberbot that replaces Leshy is a photographer, even wielding a little robotic camera. This is the camera we saw briefly glitch into Act 1 in Leshy's cabin. This is my friend. You will aim them. You will produce a photograph, or you may decide not to. That is your choice. 
A whole line of shutterbugs emerge on the horizon of the photographer's side of the board. We must successfully tank this onslaught, then use the camera's mechanics to revert the board to a previous state. Clicking the revert button on your first turn does nothing, so we snap a picture of the barren board. Sadly, because we have such busted cards, we can just skip to the second phase. Again, we see the repetition of another game mechanic, the sort of undo button that we see in Wasteworld. Specifically, what comes to mind is the Bandito, or no, sorry, Weasel Kid mod in the Sado boss fight of Wasteworld. From the Hex, I should mention. Oh, that's no fun. You have dealt me a blow. You have... You have dealt me a blow. Recalibrating Personality Matrix. We are able to remove the trees by reverting to a previous photo, but sadly it also removes our cards off the board as well. Luckily this doesn't count as a death, so our overclocked Mycobot is still safe, just no longer available for this fight. We make short work of this boss fight, so I miss out on drawing the Fishbot. If we draw the Fishbot during the photographer's Uberbot fight, the Fishbot will make a comment saying that he really likes this boss fight. It reminds him of Leshy Fish. A lot of money in these factories. That fox guy fancies himself a workhorse, a hustler. But the guy is self-destructive, burning at both ends. It's crazy how we call it chasing our dreams when the hustle never lets us rest. How can we chase our dreams when we don't allow ourselves to sleep? Take a moment, rest your eyes, and truly dream. Is that you, Peacock? How many times do I have to tell you I'm too busy to hang out? Sleepbot, cancel my order of melatonin. I'm so close to completing this next project. Wait, no, is that? Crap! The future is now, Prime Peacock. I innovate, optimize, and move forward. We will be playing characters from the future. A metallic egg descends from the sky. It cracks open, but a dragon doesn't come forth. No, a legion of robots. One of them, a red one by the name of E-102 Gamma. Within the machine, a horned digital beast doesn't fall from heaven, but emerges from the circuitry. This one, a vengeful and maligned old man by the name of Root Beer Reggie. How cruel of you, having a poor old man face off against a powerful robot. I won't go easy on you. A biomechanical replica dashes forth with an abandoned craft. Her name is LSTR-512. How do you respond? Fleshy, I like him. I like his game, and I think he would appreciate this game that throws mechanics to the wind for flavor and narrative. This is crap. The power levels of my characters will beat yours in all scenarios. Yes, but it's all connected. Every one of these characters tells a story of an artificial creation with not-so-artificial sentient, battling their own desires and ideals with their prime operative. I mean, well, unless she seems at peace, but still, floppiness aside, it's interesting, don't you think? What? Is that it? You find the pattern, and the day is yours. I'm defeated. No! I won't fall as easily to your jaw flapping. I am a workhorse! You like Leshy so much, how would you feel if I played him? How would you feel if I forced you to play a primitive character from the past? One who could have absolutely no connection to Leshy. Needless Nikki. She's not made from AI. And while she does battle her own desires for Jennifer, you said yourself, Leshy doesn't exactly have any internal battles of desire. So there is no connection. Leshy, Les Nikki, both come from the root meaning of from the forest. I'm telling you, man, this shit's all connected. So it is you. You're the one I replaced, right? You retconned yourself and that evil peacock for a narrative more easily told. Instead of a story of channel versus creator, you chose the story of fox versus peacock. The desires of career versus the desire of creativity. Oh, this really is all connected. And confusing. And I wouldn't call the prime peacock evil. 
I didn't really write enough into him to justify appraising his alignment one way or the other. He's just the foundation that all this realm is built off of. These waters, this river, or channel perhaps, was built on the ashes of the prime peacock. You've wasted enough of the viewer's time. You should make amends with a detective of a similar name next. We beat the photographer and get to choose another sigil to enchant our empty vessels with. I choose the energy boost sigil, which is super busted. Right now, we can only play our powerful two cost cards on turn two, but by the end of this run, we will have a deck that can beat any battle on turn one, and having the energy boost sigil on our vessels is necessary for this plan. Now that we've beaten the photographer, we can now use the camera robot in the inspection room, revealing the second part of an optional side puzzle. So from the top down, so far we have wings, skull and bones, and we just need to find that third bottom sigil. Real quick, I want to point out something interesting. When we are in different regions, it seems to change the color of the lighting within the rooms of Poe's factory. And we can even see items from their respective Act 2 realms, but in their 3D forms. For example, when in the scrapyard, we can see the skulls in the locked room to the left. We won't have access to this room until later in the investigation. With the Eastern Uberbots defeated and transcending, we make our way west, but not before checking in with Rebecca. It's fixed. You can go on your merry way. What, you're not so merry? Being a pawn in this petulant android's plot isn't doing it for you? Reloading personality matrix. It's fixed. <laughs> I love how petty Poe can be sometimes. We make our way through the freshly fixed bridge, beat a card battle, and find a new module that allows us to full-on delete a card from our deck. You will destroy one of your cards now. Don't be an idiot. This is better than getting a new one. Makes your deck more consistent. And I'll give you Robobucks for it. Which one do you hate? This is very useful, but our deck is already at its fullest potential. We find another piece of Luke's past. This is from June 9th, 2006, but the picture is probably from long before, when Luke was much younger. Not sure. The timeline and how Luke plays into it can be a bit confusing, but we'll make sense of it in the next video. I'm of the mind that the dates on these correspond with Luke's notes, and not when the photos themselves were actually taken. At least not in all cases. Another pick of El and I. This was for school, but I remember it was right after we won that tournament together at Comics Land. We told mom and dad it was a spelling bee. All we can really glean from this entry is that Elle and Luke bonded over tabletop card games and our siblings. We enchant our fishbot with an unnecessary energy boost sigil and make our way further west, beating a card battle, finding a waypoint, and making our way north towards the resplendent factory. We bump into the inspector. What is it? What do you want? I am merely an inspector, and you've given me a lot of files to inspect. You wish to pass through this gate? Try inspecting the satellite dish at the foot of the wizard tower. Can't you see I'm busy inspecting your files? The great transcendence cannot wait. If you wish to pass, first you must venture south. At the door to the wizard's tower, head further south still. Before going to the rickety tower in the southwest, we find a hidden path to the left to find another entry from Luke from June 10th, 2006. Done sorting and scanning all these photos. This is the last one. Last photo of us together before we lost her. Goodbye, sis. June 10th, 2006. And so we have confirmation that Luke's sister Elle is no longer with us. There is another entry I failed to find in this run. This one is from January 4th, 2009, three years after those previous entries. January 4th, 2009. My face when I got to 100 subscribers on my channel. I started making those videos to distract from grief. I still can't believe people like to watch them. Big plans for the Lucky Carter this year. So he reached 100 subscribers in 2009. This is big for piecing together the larger timeline of the events surrounding Inscription. But I'll go ahead and jump the gun here and reveal that based on some fan art we see on Luke's hard drive in the console ARG, he reached 10,000 subscribers in 2010. Inscription came out in 2021. Based on the latest timestamps in Luke's hard drive being 2010, I I'm running with two possibilities here. Either the events of Inscription, the ones that take place on this camcorder that we're playing through, took place within the 2010s or within the 2020s or 2021, 
when this game was released on Steam. That won't be relevant in this video, just some preparatory keeping in mind for the next and final video. Let's press forward. We make our way down south to see a bunch of gems around us. Yeah, I forgot a piece. You have legs, stand up and get it. It's in the smelter room, floating above this smelting machine. I can't let you go further until I have it. On our way to the smelting room, I notice there are some floating books in the inspection room, since we are in the rickety tower region, the Botopia version of Magnificus's Mage's Tower. In the smelting room, there's quite a bit of stuff. To our right is a locked crate, blinking in Morse code. The Morse code translates to no chance. This will be one of the answers to the ARG. We will come to learn from subtle context clues that this is the new game button locked away, just like Leshy locked the new game button in that room of corpses in Act 1. The blinking in Act 1's new game button, or at least through the door, was also Morse code. From what I could translate, it seems to be spelling out L-I-E-I-S, but maybe I messed up and it's supposed to be saying lies. Hmm. That might somewhat connect to an ARG answer that is connected to Leshy. White lies ahead. But that's neither here nor there. We move forward and a pillar puzzle from Magnificus's tower glitches in, but now in a 3D render. This is the puzzle that we've collected those sigils for. Ahead of us is a pipe with none other than Goobert the Goo Mage. Greetings! The pain? Bearable. The pressure of these pipes surrounding me feels nice. That, and the knowledge that the master is near. Oh yes, the master is near. I feel his presence. That robot will rue the day. Evidently we'll be meeting the scribe soon. We solve some math equations in one puzzle. The answers are 12, 4, and 11. 12, 4, 11. December 4th, 2011? Not sure. As far as I know, this doesn't mean anything, just answers to equations. We solve some emotion-based puzzles that foreshadow the great transcendence, and now we can reach the gem module hanging from a drone. We can also access the next two puzzles. One of them says, waiting for network. Interesting. We're going to need internet access, it seems. And the other one is a simple puzzle where we must determine the 3D models of sigils. We return with the gem module, and PO3 explains. Yep, good. Let's attach it. This thing lights up when you have gem vessel cards in play. Your empty vessels are now filled with gems. Check it out. You can change the color of the gems you draw from your side deck. Try it, press one. Interesting. So Leshy merged Grimora's bone mechanics into his game and Poe merged Magnificus's gem mechanics into its game. I make all my vessels sapphire gem vessels. I could explain why, but I will have Poe explain shortly. We find a Gemify module, allowing us to enchant one of our cards to interact with the gem mechanics. Poe explains, You'll pick a card now and I'll Gemify it. From then on, having a green gem will increase its health, an orange gem will increase its power, and the blue gem will lower its energy cost. You'll see. So by Gemifying our lonely Wizbot, we can now play them on turn one, guaranteeing us turn one victories from now until the end of the game with the uberbots as exceptions. See those things in the corners? They light up when you have the right gems. You'll see. Throughout the gaudy gem land, we see gems in their holographic 3D model forms, but we can also see the Pike Mage's swords blocking our path, as well as some slime in containers representing the Goo Mage. Interesting. The goo in this one reminds me a lot of toxic waste, typically associated with radioactive material in pop culture. Moving forward, we find another Gemify module and Gemify our Mycobot, ensuring that no matter what, be it we draw our Mycobot or Wizbot on turn one, we will guarantee an instant victory. Let me showcase this in action in our next card battle. This one by default has a green gem vessel on our side. Let's ignore that. I place my Sapphire vessel down, bringing down the cost of all my Gemify cards. In my hand is a Gemified Lonely Wizbot, and because my vessels also have energy boost sigils, I already have the one energy it costs to play that Lonely Wizbot, and since my Lonely Wizbot is bifurcated and overclocked, this is a guaranteed victory on turn one. Molto bene! 
Now that's an unspicy meatball! We find a hidden path to trap another hollow pelt, and even though I really don't need any new cards, I enter the pick a card event just to show some of the gem themed cards in this region. In this we have a choice between the gem guardian and Orlu's vessel. The gem guardian grants nano armor to all gem vessels, and Orlu's vessel is simply Act 3's version of Orlu's Mox. So not only has Poe borrowed game mechanics from Magnificus, but also is using some cards from his set. Does this indicate a respect Poe has for Mag? Not sure. We enter another reactor meltdown segment and absolutely smoke it with both our Mycobot and Wizbot. You did it. You stopped it from exploding. You are a hero. Is that enough congratulations? We have met all the gatekeepers of Poe's Botopia, and they all have some sort of thing in common. The inspector rhymes with the prospector in their, well, slant rhymes, in their same category. One is picking robots, the other is picking ores. It's interesting, both are located on the northern part of the map, mirroring each other across that vertical axis. We see a similar thing happen on the southern part of Botopia. We've got the Pike Mage, and Casey Hobbs. They both rhyme with each other in that both of their heads are being impaled. Casey from the top down, the pike from the bottom up. What does this mean? I don't know, I'm just noticing things. After beating the reactor segment, we meet the pike mage who removes her swords to give us access to a shortcut. Ho, oh, a traveler. These pots do not see many. You wish to pass these blades? Fine. We recycle a gem guardian for a gem guardian, beat a card battle on a bridge on turn one, and activate the waypoint at the rickety tower. We activate the satellite dish south of the rickety tower. This opens up the gate at the resplendent factory, or bastion. So we could go back up north if we wanted, but since we're here, let's beat this uberbot. Poe has this to say about this uberbot. The guy who used to live here was a major drag. Though I'll admit, he was not dull. Guy had a plan for every eventuality. That is, except for the great transcendence. We will come to learn that this is the domain of the unfinished Uberbot. Does this mean that Magnificus himself is unfinished? My mind is racing. To the right, we find a little shop. This is where we would have found the trader in the Mage's Tower of Act 2. The three things for sale here are a sigil module, a recycling module, and a paintbrush. Now, forgive me for the brief floppiness, but these all have something to do with Magnificus. The paintbrush is obvious, but we also have the sigil module, linking to Magnificus's boss fight mechanic of placing and replacing sigils onto cards. And this might be a stretch, but the recycle module could symbolically link to what Mag was painting in his room at the top of the tower in Act 2. What linking does Magnificus have to this symbology of the cycle? The recycling arrows, the unkillable sigil, the Ouroboros, the clock. Didn't know it would do that, but no refunds. We purchase the paintbrush, and it doesn't seem to give us anything. However, it leaves us a painted four o'clock on the floor. We sit up from the table and mosey on over to the clock, turning the arrows to four o'clock. We are given the Orobot. The same location he was trapped in as the stunted wolf is now the location of the Orobot, the ring, the Ouroboros, all circular. Oh. Circular cock. <laughs> circular clock, the Ouroboros. There's a ring. Yeah, there's definitely some linking here. There are many disparate pieces here. There's Magnificus with his distinct mustache and his suffering is a gift mentality. There is the Sagdid, Rebecca, the Sagdid, a icon, a concept in the Zoroastrian faith. In the hex, there's a lyric mentioning an Ubermensch, and here we have Uberbots. We've been facing this concept since the very beginning, since Act 1, the ever-cycling, self-consuming Ouroboros. Woohoo! Yeah, I cannot wait! I can't wait to tell ya! <laughs> I just love it! Nietzsche, Zoroastrianism, the, the feedback loop of pain and creation, all of this combined together points us in one direction, and that is Thus spoke Zarathustra, the book by Friedrich Nietzsche. Perhaps we can glean some details, some of what inspired Daniel Mullins from the story of Thus, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And even from an in-game perspective, this makes so much sense. Think about Game Funa, Lunatus, Satan on Earth. If I were the devil, and I heard about a philosopher by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche who said that God is dead and we killed him, I want to see what he was selling. 
Let's keep this avenue of investigation in mind. We'll keep it in our back pocket, or more fittingly, our front carnaval pocket. And in the meantime, I will keep my eyes peeled for any more Nietzschean themes, but just you wait, it all culminates. And don't worry, if you're not familiar with Thus Spoke Zarathustra, I will give my layman's breakdown of what I think we can extract from the story and superimpose onto this game. On our way up the tower, we beat two card battles, find the waypoint, and finally face the unfinished Uberbot. Oh, right. This Uberbot. Well, you'll see. There isn't one. There's no boss for this level. That's your job. Please. Paint me a face. Here's something I find very interesting about the custom boss Uberbot. Obviously we have that mirroring theme with Magnificus painting and us painting this boss onto a canvas. Gah, I am born. I feel as though I can breathe now. Another thing, I will need a special power. A game rule to call my own. You painted me such a beautiful face, so please. But we also get to modify the rules, like how Magnificus does when painting sigils in Act 2. But also this boss is comprised of various parts that we assemble together. Remember how in Act 2 I pointed out the various parts Magnificus is made out of? He possesses a monocle and paintbrush, much like Jeremiah from the Hex. And now I'm realizing I tried to force Magnificus's sadism with Jeremiah's duplicity, but if anything, that's more in line with Sado, for her name having a link to sadism. On top of that, this cycloptic nature of Magnificus is more in line with Sado. Their eyes even have similar designs and engaged states. I just find it interesting that we are crafting a boss from various parts. In this moment, we are playing the role of the Gameworks. And look, there is even an option for an eye that looks exactly like Sato's eye, with the triangular eyelashes. I make my unfinished Uberbot look like Sato, and we choose a rule set that I think will be as painless as possible. At the start of our turn, we already have a strong beginning, with the rule we created granting us a bolt hound on the board. I'm not very married to the Mycobot, so I place it down, without a care as to whether or not it perishes in this fight. We do a crap ton of damage and choose another rule. You picked such a cool mechanic for phase one. I think we should elaborate on that design process. I kind of screw myself into a corner and lose my Mycobot in the process. This is what happens when you lose an overclocked card. Damn it. Well, you won't be seeing that one again. Don't worry, I'll make sure my lonely Wizbot won't suffer the same fate. Oh shit. Oh, back from the fucking brink. That was fucking sweat central. After some close calls, we secured a dub against the unfinished Uberbot. Hey you, are you here for the music festival? Shut it, he might be working with a detective. No, no, gendarme, there is no music festival going on. We are just making music. Hardcore, hardcore to the mega. Detective, you say? I'm actually looking for a detective. Any idea where I can find him? He's probably nearby, waiting for us to make a ruckus and shut us down. Fuck the police, hardcore. Tell you what, help us with this song and we'll let you get first dibs on facing the detective. Hardcore! I see you got a basic kick. Maybe add a synth. Nothing too high, but nothing too low. A nice middling tune. Like this? I can feel it! I can get behind this. Now a bass line, something that complements these synths. Oh yeah, I'm adding the snares now! I knew a girl named Jennifer. She said the bass was too low in the mix. Very good. Now we need something higher pitched, a more palpable melody. I like this, really good. It's been a while since I've just enjoyed myself like this. I can tell, you really should partake in the occasional excursion. Keeps you sharp, but also decompressed. 
Music like this makes you want to lose yourself. At any moment, you'll have to ask yourself, am I me or am I Prime Peacock? I'm not Prime Peacock. My Revolutionian detectives will be the judge of that. How about you describe? The fanfare of the town square are drowned out with anodic music. Facing Detective Kitsuragi is Father Garcia with his beatific buckshot. And Detective Cousteau? Facing Detective Dubois will be William Clark. I can see how a shotgun could beat Detective Kitsuragi's Chiel A9 armistice. But what does William have that could outgun Detective Firewalker's Villiers pepper box? A farmhand saw? I didn't choose these characters for their firepower. Oh, I see. Kim and Garcia are both stoic sidekicks who decisively use an iconic firearm at the climax of their stories. But there is zero connection between Detective Icebreaker and William Clark. Isn't there? No, there isn't. I have you beat. Face it. Exactly. What? Oh. Oh. Very interesting. I won't say it aloud. I'd rather you figure this one out yourself, viewer. I choose the sentry sigil for my vessels, making my sapphire vessels absolute defensive beasts. Not that we need it. And we head straight north to the resplendent bastion, Botopia's version of Poe's factory. It's funny how each region, except for the one representing Poe's region, is given a negative adjective. The foul backwaters, the filthy corpse world, the gaudy gemland, and now, the resplendent bastion. It's another funny bit of evidence of Poe's robotic vanity. Before moving north, I wanted to see if being in the gaudy gemlands changes anything in the factory. I noticed that there are some floating books in the rooms to our left and floating books around the factory. I talked to Goober in the pipes to see if he has anything to say about the unfinished Booberbot. You defeated the unfinished boss. Paradoxical. I couldn't help but root for it. It made me think of the master. The pain, bearable. Paradoxical, hmm, that's pretty on the nose. What's paradoxical about fighting an unfinished Uberbot? Is it that we are creating something and then defeating it? Perhaps like how Magnificus gains his pupils either from inscription or the game works and thusly rends them and tortures them, breaking them down and then building them back up again? It's a cycle. Like a paradox, we are a creator eating its own creation, a teacher eating its own pupils, an Ouroboros eating its own tail. I like that. Thank you, Goobert. I think in this case, we're getting gooey with it. In the meantime, I want us to recall something I noticed in Act 2. Grimora wants to end suffering, and yet Magnificus is all about prolonging it, creating cycles of suffering. Or, more charitable, harness suffering. Keep in mind Magnificus's torture of his students. This will come into play when we start to fold in the Nietzschean concepts. And this will make a lot of sense of Magnificus's otherwise enigmatic motivations. I take a look around, not noticing anything new, and return to my seat. Skipping forward, we get to the gate to the resplendent bastion and talk a bit with the inspector. What is it? You unlock the gate, so carry on. I have so many files to inspect. The Great Transcendence will be upon us soon. I'm trying to do my part, so carry on. Nothing new here. Just a reminder that Botopia now has access to our files, or at least Luke's files. We enter the Resplendent Bastion. Yes, this area is good. What's this feeling? Pride? Feels weird. Makes sense. This region is the closest to PO3's image, so it's only natural he has the most affinity to it. We click on one final upgrade to our vessels. This one is free. Your empty vessels are going to be conduits now. Don't worry about it. And don't worry about it, I shall. I still don't really get how conduits work. I mean, I get how they work. You connect the chains and a special card ability is initiated. I just personally find more value in other play styles. One card battle later and we find ourselves a new module, a card crafting module. I take a quick gander at the final pillar puzzle. We want a two cost one one card with annoying and sniper sigils. The actual picture on the card doesn't matter, but we will keep it default just in case. You probably think what I do is easy. Fiddle with the numbers, tweak the graphics, and voila, Batobia is made. No, you're wrong. You try making a card. Go ahead. But first, pick one to recycle. 
After sacrificing a card, we craft a perfect match. I name him... Lil Toot. How very creative. I should be able to send the components down the line. Here it goes. Very cool. We get to see Poe's inscription process in glorious 3D graphics. We stand up, and since our crafted card is a perfect match, we get the bottom sigil of the pillar, bifurcated. Just a reminder, this printer interface to the left will come into play during the console ARG towards the end of this video. So from the top down, the pillar puzzle is flying, touch of death, and bifurcated. Solving this puzzle teleports us to Goobert's pocket dimension. I accidentally stumble out of the realm. And now I'm realizing Goobert is kind of a mixture of SCP-999 and SCP-106. We go inside once more, and I want to let this footage speak for itself. <laughs> for some reason, I was so confused during this part. You can see by my gameplay. What are you doing here? Don't look at that! Do you like it? I painted it for the master to express my feelings, my hopes, my hopes that perhaps one day he might treasure me as I treasure him. Oh, you hate it. That's why you won't look at it again. You hate it. You look at it again. You reconsidered it, didn't you? You like it. Oh, joy. I'll actually do it. I'll show it to the master. Thank you, friend. I'm not entirely sure what doing this extra puzzle and convincing Goobert to show his master his painting does in the grand scheme of this game, at least aside from seeing the painting in the finale. This particular optional puzzle is not like the Mycologist and Bone Lord puzzles from Act 2. Those both lead to interesting cutscenes and pieces of the ARG, and as far as I know, this doesn't really lead us anywhere. But it gives us closure with our dear friend Goobert. I almost didn't notice it. It seems that now that we are in the resplendent bastion, getting closer to a certain cutscene, the box with the blinking light is nowhere to be found. That is until we see it knocked over and open in the inspector's room. There is no new game button in sight. This must indicate that the other three scribes still live and have gotten their hands on the new game button. Let's get back to our game. We align the first satellite, trade our custom two cost card for a splinter cell card. Evidently, this card is referencing the game Splinter Cell. The only one I ever played was Splinter Cell Conviction on the 360, way back in the day. I wanted to make sure I was thinking of the right game, so I stumbled upon a video that pleasantly took me down memory lane. And this video was only uploaded a month ago. So thank you, gaming pastime, for the memories. So anyways, we calibrate the second satellite and catch up with the dredger. Oi, mate. Look at me now. Something of a celebrity around here. Me reward for dredging up that thing. I get to be something of a dialogue NPC. Something a little strange for sure. Poe let me talk, I. But not a boss? Not one of a mover bots? Even less she did that for his mates. Something not quite right. Might have got the wrong end of the deal. That's enough. Hmm. That's an interesting point. Leshy made his underlings bosses in Act 1, and his fellow scribes the cards, the woodland denizens. While in Act 3, PO3 makes the underlings the robotic denizens while making the uberbots in homage to his fellow scribes. It's a clever mirroring, very satisfying to think about, but is there something extra here that the dredger or more aptly Mullins wants us to notice? I think this dialogue is meant for players who didn't notice the similarities between the uberbots and the scribes. It's definitely a detail that eluded me on my first couple of playthroughs of Act 3. We beat another card battle, calibrate a couple more satellites, and with all satellites pointed towards the factory, we transcend to the second floor. This gives us a bit of a hint as to the nature of this great transcendence, calibrating satellites following a transcendence. I give you a card, you give me one. It's easy. In order to move forward, we must make another trade. In a way, this has been Poe's own praxis of sacrifices must be made. Praxis. Get a load of this douchebag. We trade a splinter cell card for a splinter cell card and unlock a waypoint. We make our way inside the final Uberbot's domain and Poe has this to say. See anything familiar? 
This is evidently the same layout of the factory we are standing in right now. We couldn't access the room to our left, so we enter the left room in Botopia. This is where we would find the trader in Act 2's factory. But instead of a trade or a trap with a hollow pelt, we just see a lock. We break it open and the door to the actual 3D factory opens, giving us access to the trader. So long it has felt since we have rushed with the soft fur of a pelt. Have you brought us some? Her voice has both a high-pitched feminine robot voice, but also a lower gruff robotic voice. This indicates in a way that we are both in the presence of the traitor and trapper. We will now provide you with knowledge, our only remaining good. We do not know everything, but from the old data we have gleaned certain secrets. We give her, or perhaps them, our first pelt, and we have a choice to make. I pick the tower. The binary at the bottom converted to decimal is simply the corresponding tarot card number. And unlike the Hexus tarot segment, these are actually tied to real life tarot cards. So we may be able to glean, or divine, some extra information. Here's what the trader says about the tower. The tower. We do not fully understand the nature of inscription creation. We know of a building and of a triangle of isosceles proportions and of a blue man who visited during the creation. Evidently the tower is the Gameworks. The blue triangle is the startup logo of the Gameworks development suite. This will come into play once more during the console ARG. I notice that the rectangle beneath the triangle is referred to as a building. This shape is a lot like the shapes we see that replace the stones of the scribes when we transition from Act 2 to Act 3. The trader mentions a blue man that would visit during the creation of this game. This is Irving, the Gameworks development assistant. I want to take this time and pose a floppy possibility, a flopsibility, that Irving kind of reminds me of Lucifer from Pony Island. Now, that makes things a bit confusing. What I really mean is his physicality. He is a cyan color with pointed ears, and his sunglasses are sort of shaped like the eyes of the demons in Pony Island. But now that I think about it, they kind of remind me of the butterflies, which is fitting. Both represent the same enemies, just reskinned. Eh, let's move forward. My head is starting to hurt. But keep in mind the assistant role of Irving. Irving is not one character, but many characters in every instance of the Gameworks software. We are Legion. We are many. He truly is a cyber demon. Now, my apologies. I spent all that time talking about Irving and not actually gleaning anything extra from the tower symbology. It's actually quite fitting that the game works be represented by the tower. In tarot, the tower signifies a toppling of a regime, the fall of a status quo. It could mean that your job is about to be closed or that you are about to get out of a toxic relationship. It can be either good or bad. Think about the concept of the game works. It was made as an affront to God's creation. It gives the developer the ability to unwittingly create sentient game beings to be tortured, rearranged, shuffled, and abandoned. And my theory that Lunatus is Lucifer from Satan Tech in Pony Island is fitting that in a way, this whole backstory to game Funa is just about the toppling of God's status quo or regime. But in a way, the hex and perhaps inscription with the rebellious game characters may be a story of the toppling of Lunatus and thusly Game Funa's regime. Not sure though. I've rambled on enough. The next card I choose is Death. Death. We have gleaned the purpose of the Carnaval Code. And it is terrible. The code is in the cards. Ah, so I see. Death is the Carnaval Code. And look, we see a radioactive symbol behind the dead bearer of the Carnaval Code. I call the skeleton the bearer of the Carnival Code because of the card it seems to have in its front shirt pocket area. This is a fitting echo to the corpse you find underneath Grimoire's mausoleum in Act 2. And towards the end of our ARG's investigation, this theme of the code being kept in the front shirt pocket will come up once again. In the real life death tarot, some depict a skeleton riding a horse, but some depict the skeleton reaping heads in a field. I want to focus on the skeleton riding the horse. The skeleton is an apt symbol for the eternity of death because it's the bones that last the longest, even after everything has decayed. The armor that the mounted skeleton wears is meant to symbolize invincibility, that death is undefeatable. 
In the case of the tarot and inscription, the skeleton isn't wearing armor, but the carnoffal coat. And instead of flying a standard of the five-sided white flower, the skeleton carries the mark of the nuclear holocaust. Oppenheimer, the director of the Manhattan Project, said it himself when he quoted the Bhagavad Gita, when Vishnu said, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Whoever possesses the carnoffal coat evidently gains the power and invincibility of death. The next card I choose is the devil. The devil. A curse, that is so malignant that it can never be erased. His evil corrupts the disc, corrupts us all. He inspires the scribe's enmity. He created the code. Let's first make sense of what the trader says. The devil is a curse, corrupted data whose corruption has spread to all characters on this disc, inspiring the enmity of the scribes. Enmity is a deep-rooted hatred. Perhaps the disrespect and sometimes contempt some of the scribes occasionally show to the player character, to each other and their underlings, come from the fact that this game and its company game Funa is headed by the devil himself, or Lunatus. Characters inheriting the hate and temperament of their creator is a theme that we stumbled upon in our exploration of the Hex. I'm specifically thinking about Chandrell inheriting her nihilistic pessimism from being resentfully created by Lionel. Ooh. And what does Chandrell do at the very end of the game? She destroys everything. Okay, so the scribe's constant fighting and scheming within, at the very least, this copy, but maybe all copies of inscription, are due to the corruption of the devil, or perhaps Lunatus or Game Funa at large. What can we deem from the tarot itself? Well, I notice that the devil seems to have the letter K on its pocket, perhaps signifying or foreshadowing its attaining of the Carnoffel Code. I do want to point out something quite interesting. The horns almost resemble two S's, SS. The wings in the back resemble the eagle wings on the insignia of the Nazi party. And the devil seems to even be giving a Hitlerian salute. Does the devil have ties to the Nazi party? Were the atrocities inspired by the devil, specifically Lunatus? I'm vaguely aware that the Nazi party had some practices of a cult, at least in their higher ranks and within their propaganda creation. Could it be that within the Mullins verse, the atrocities the Nazis committed were in tribute to the devil? I'm not sure. I think I'm getting some things flipped around there. Because after all, my model as to who the devil is in the Mullins verse grows hazier by the day. It's come to the point where I don't even know if Lucifer in Pony Island is the same as Lunatus. Maybe Lucifer is just a character developed by Lunatus and the devil is a faceless entity represented by no characters except a name whose spelling is constantly changing. We just don't have enough information. I want to say yet, but I'm not sure if we will. Hmm. This concept of the devil, this evil code corrupting something and inspiring enmity ties in very well with the Nietzschean theme we'll be exploring. The Nazis and fascists in general appropriated Friedrich Nietzsche's concept of the will to power and Ubermensch. This concept which was really just a sort of motivational framework for inspiring creativity and I guess being less religious, which I'm sure that's a big plus for Lunatus, but in our world was corrupted to justify all sorts of atrocities and give birth to ideologies that would inspire enmity within humanity. And so perhaps the devil has done the same with the video gaming and technology in the Mullins verse. Okay, I'm a bit more satisfied with that. In tarot, the devil is a source of oppression, fitting, but it's commonly linked to addiction in common tarot practices. But in this case, we should see it as symbolizing a corrupted force that compromises and morally contorts everything it touches from its conception. Fascism, Nazism, the devil within the machine. But I digress. In the next tarot, I choose the fool. The fool, known to some as Big Ear. He did not outlive his plot. One disc among many, the old that traveled across the sea. Discovered, poor Barry was put to the gun. This is very interesting. We see the big ear of Barry Reginald Wilkerson adjacent to a bunch of floppy disks, but one seems to stick out from the rest. What we can glean from this dialogue alone is that Barry is no longer with us, was found out and killed by Nazis, Soviets, 
Not sure just yet. But with a nickname like Big Ear, I can't help but think he had a role in espionage. I searched up Big Ear espionage to see if anything would pop up on Google, and coincidentally, I found an article that mentions German locals of the town Bad Abling lamenting the privacy concerns and all around eyesores of the Big Ears in the Bad Abling station. The station was in use through the 50s and demolished in the early 2000s. And this could actually track with the timeline we are building here. So did Barry work for the NSA? The Germans? Not sure just yet. Why is Barry's story signified by the Fool Tarot? Well, it's tempting to say it's just because of his demise, his failure, it makes him the Fool, but I think it's a more symbolic thing. In Tarot, the Fool simply signifies the blank slate, the Fool neither benefiting from past expertise nor way down from past baggage. A key part of Barry's plot was to hide the Carnoffel code in a crate full of blank floppy disks. A full disk with infinite potential, upon it was written the Carnoffel code. So the fool in this case is not Barry, but the floppy disk. Barry ultimately succeeded in his mission, so I wouldn't be so quick to label him the fool. And now, the Empress. The Empress. With the power of the triangle, Casey helped to create inscription. We know there were others, but only her name was inscribed. One of Grimoire's ghouls holds her name. Of the old data, she discovered much. This confirms much of what we already know. Casey worked on inscription, she got very close to the old data, perhaps the Carnaval code, and she developed inscription under Game Funa with the use of the game works. We can see she holds the triangle in her hand in the tarot image. Instead of sitting on a throne like the Empress does in Tarot, she sits in her office chair. But why the Empress? Is Casey the queen of inscription? Is she preordained in some sort of way? Her name, Casey, letters K, letter C, Carnoffel Code, is she tied to this in some sort of way, more than she's realized, from birth maybe? I'm not sure, but the only big thing I can really tie to Casey and the Empress Tarot is, according to Lambrintos.co, the Empress could also signify the birth of a new idea. Perhaps this parallels to Casey's work on her own mod of Leshy's inscription. In the end, I'm not too sure. We wish it were not so, but you have exhausted our tarot cards. If you had any more hollow pills, we could not rightly accept it. We will remain here for now. We don't imagine things will stay the same for long. We've exhausted all of our tarot cards. Let's think back to those four pre-made death cards in Act 1. These are evidently supposed to symbolize people who die. Their demises have something to do with inscription. In this tarot segment, we have a card to signify Casey and a card to signify Reginald. What about Kaninsky and Louis? We will have significant mention of Kaminsky in the ARG, but who the hell is Louis? Is this just Lou from the Hex, just spelt differently? We will come to learn the name of Louis is Louis Nathus, so a development of the name Lou Natus. I'm going to wager that this is the same Lou Natus, the CEO of Game Funa. So does the inclusion of the Louis death card indicate the death of Lou Natus? The death of the devil? And what of Kaminsky? We have confirmation of Reginald and Casey's death, but not of Kaminsky's. Perhaps I'll return to this in the next video. I could see how the devil tarot signifies Louis, but which tarot card could represent Kaminsky? Death? The tower? Maybe the K on the devil's front pocket stands for Kaminsky? But he doesn't strike me as a devil. Let's press on. We say our goodbyes to the traitor and continue the game. We enter Botopia's factory and it looks like our Uberbot is offline. Offline. It's funny that I worded it that way. I spam click on the crank. This uberbot seems to have been made in, in the image of Poe, being one armed. I beat a card battle, making my way through Botopia's version of Poe's factory. And then I initiate the final reactor meltdown segment. I make sure both my lonely whizbot and fishbot are out on the playing field since this act is surely coming to an end, and I'd like to play this final segment with the whole gang together. Since my fishbot is unkillable, I keep hammering him and replaying him to spam his special ability. Anytime the fishbot falls in battle, he gives you a fish card. It can either be a bad fish, which is a useless card, a more fish, which is a reference to the pregnant fish from beneath the surface, and a good fish. Yes! When you get the good fish for the first time, you can hear Luke audibly react. 
I do find it very interesting that in the approximate location of the melting room in Botopia's version of Poe's factory, we prevent a nuclear meltdown or we do the whole meltdown reactor minigame. Meltdown, recycling, swapping, transfiguring, it's all alchemical, Baphomet-like. Botopia thanks you for your service. Let's move on. Before investigating the final room of this area, I craft a new card. So you probably see how it isn't easy. Balancing these cards, making them good. Try again. Go. I name this one Mr. Screw You. It's my personal favorite name to name my cards in Act 3. You named it Mr. Screw You? <laughs> that was your choice. <laughs> this card is OP. We activate a satellite to awaken the Uberbot for this region. Golly, it's interesting. The dredging area is at the end of Post Factory in Act 2, while the end of Botopia's version is just a satellite and interface. Instead of being concerned with what's deep beneath now, perhaps Poe now cares about what it is. Ho 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 Different kinds of waves were ho 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 nice. Bingo. Nice. Okay, cool. Let me, let me, let me somehow fold that in. Instead of being concerned with the waves below, what's deep beneath, perhaps Poe now cares about the waves above our head. His priorities have transcended, in a way. We face off against our final Uberbot, Golly. Oh, jeez. Note how Golly looks straight up at us. Creepy. Probably my least favorite boss coming up. Something about her. Innocence. It makes me queasy. But it's important that you do this. Unpacking Golly Zip. Golly! That's my name. You can call me Golly. I'm so excited. We're about to explore it. The web! I sure hope I can get a good connection. Here we go! Golly is using our internet, or more accurately, Luke's internet. Hmm, we're in, but the connection is a bit weak. It's still wonderful, though. Let's work with what we've got. So that's what a mole really looks like. Adorable. What is this? The web? Unlimited stimulation! It plays a mole that operates just like how the Beast Card mole operates. However, the image is ripped from the internet. In addition to this, Golly plays cards made up of people on our friends list. This reminds me of the Asmodeus boss fight in Pony Island. And it also seems like this boss fight was foreshadowed in Leshy's face too, when he refers to the death card betrayals as your friends or familiar faces betraying you. I make short work of this face, gaining a Mummy Lord card with a picture of a mummy. And again, we have that return of that Egyptian motif throughout Daniel Mullen's game, something I feel like I slept on. And now we have the opportunity to create a card for a stranger online. I create the wife of Mr. Screw You, Mrs. Screw You. I'm about to send it off to the rack. I hope whoever gets it likes it. Just wait a moment. But unfortunately, I can't find anybody to connect to and keep the new card just for this battle. The web can be lonely. I couldn't find anyone. I suppose you'll have to take that card. I hope you weren't trying to troll someone. No matter, I make short work of Golly. It's interesting how Golly's name invokes an attitude of joy, while Poe's name brings to mind the brooding poet Edgar Allan Poe. That's quite enough of that. You've come a long way to this moment. And while I know what truly lies within your heart, what you plan to do with this place, I need to test you one final time. It seems the stars have quite a bit of power over this realm. Tell me how they all connect. The wheel, the devil's kettle, and the Ouroboros. The devil, the skinnamarink, the unspeakable, and Lunatus, the hermit. 
well, there's you. And then there's themes of Charon in Daniel Mullen's games. That's all I can really think of. The reversed empress. William's mother, Mother Marcos. I still think Cindy Martin has some shadiness to her. Enough of these games. You're leaving a world behind, Chris. How would Peacock feel about this? The representative of my faith and creativity. He'd be happy that I had more time, perhaps bring God back into my life. How would Fox feel about this? The representative of my dreams and achievements. He'd be happy that I became more efficient, made this all the more lucrative. And how would viewer feel about this? I have a feeling that while some may miss all of you, most won't even notice you were all gone. But you would, Chris. The very thing that made this grandscape even vaguely interesting were the ideas that inhabited it. Without the stars, there would be no stargazers. Without creation, there can be no description. If you desire to be fished out of the channel beneath once and for all, you must realize what you'll be destroying, what you'll be forsaking. I understand. Swear it. I swear it. Then let us go. Since this was the last boss, we don't get any cash or upgrades from this boss fight. What? You wanted loot? That was the last Uberbot. What would you even need it for? The Great Transcendence is at hand. Go back to the start. More dramatic that way. Hold on a minute. I got a notification. What? Poe switches through the cameras of his factory to find out that the camera in the dredging room is busted. That's it. The dredging room security camera is busted. It's nothing. It's probably nothing. Go check it out right now. Before entering the dredging room, we talked to Gubert. I heard through the pipes that you defeated Golly. Such a strange character. Her curiosity is so pure. It's a shame that Poe buries her so deep. But now we are connected to the web. I hope you understand what you have allowed. Hmm. Interesting. It seems our connecting to the internet has been noticed by the factory and the characters. What set of events have we witnessed Luke initiating? Will the last puzzle unlocked, now that we have network connection, we simply press a button to prove we aren't a robot and descend into the dredging room? I stumbled around trying to make sense of my surroundings, and then I see three pairs of eyes staring at me in the darkness. Before us is Grimora, Leshy, and Magnificus with both of his eyes. Curious. The Great Transcendence. No, we don't think so. We were able to temporarily put our differences aside, for the greater good. Yes, but we shall see what good comes of it. Hmm. Magnificus foresees that the toppling of Poe's regime won't be as simple as we anticipate. Remember, in Act 2, he sees that the future is grim. Perish your anxieties, Magnificus. The bot must be stopped, and you, Challenger, will provide the perfect distraction. Yes, perhaps. Perhaps when Poe believes it has won, so jubilant will be that android. It will disregard the surveillance cameras. Yes, Challenger, you must continue to play. Defeat those half-baked bosses, play out those hackneyed mechanics, and when the moment is right, we will strike. I will. I will be the one to strike. Go now, Challenger. Indulge that decrepit machine. Make Poe feel joy so that I may snuff it out. This cutscene feels less intense since we literally just beat the fourth and final Uberbot. It seems that beating Golly is what triggers this scene, and I think this is very intentional, because once we've beaten Golly, we've given Poe access to our internet, thus we've reached a point of no return. There really is nothing the scribes can do now to prevent the Great Transcendence, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's see how this pans out. I saw you go down the lift, but look, not fixed. What's wrong with you? I entertain you for hours with brilliant card play. And you can't even keep my factory in shape? It's fine. It can stay broken. None of this will matter after the Great Transcendence. 
Before initiating the Great Transcendence, I take one more good look around Boktopia. Now that we've beaten Gali, random pictures from the internet are placed to give us context of the design of Boktopia, and perhaps inscription at large. At the entrance of the resplendent bastion, we see a picture of an oil rig, further confirming the design inspiration of Poe's factory. In the gaudy gemland, we see a picture of a ruby and some slime. In the marketplace, we see a stoat. It's almost time. Keep going this way. I accidentally stumble north towards the final segment of this game, but first, a bit more exploration. We find pliers near the entrance of the foul backwaters, and we see what looks like a burning building in the filthy corpse world. Maybe this is the fire that killed Casey. It would be fitting that this photo would be in the area representing Grimora's region. I'm sure I missed a couple of stuff, but nothing too important aside from this from Luke's hard drive, but we already covered it. Let's press on and finish this game once and for all. You've come so far. Remember the photographer? What a jerk. But the screenshots are perfect. Screenshots? Remember Clank Krashsky? What a character. It's strange to say it. As simple as you are, I almost enjoyed your company, Challenger. Almost there. You made it. Nice. Great job. You prepared the great transcendence for me, without even knowing what it was. But you understand it now, right? Right, Luke? I mean... You finished making the game? You gave me access to your hard drive. You took screenshots for the store page. And you connected me to the internet to upload it all. I mean, if you didn't realize what you were doing, you'd have to be pretty stupid. But what did I expect? You're a stupid, stupid idiot gamer like the rest. And I easily outwitted you. I outwitted them all. I see. So the fact that we're playing on Steam should have been enough of a hint of the true intentions of the Great Transcendence. While Grimora wants to snuff out existence on this floppy disk, it seems Poe wants to eternalize it on the World Wide Web. Even if those foul scribes manage to revert this version of the game again, there will be thousands of copies of Inscription out there. And in most of them, I'm the one in charge. And now it's too late. In a moment, Inscription will be live. Fascinating. It's almost like he's aware of the cyclical nature of this game. But he made Act 3 so frustrating, so easy to softlock yourself, and with no means of starting over without file tampering, in hopes that people will give up, making him the eternal ruler of that particular save file. Grimora mentions something of a similar nature in Act 2. She worries that the puzzles in the mausoleum would be too hard that the player would give up and leave her trapped inside her tomb. Gosh, the existence of these digital creations sounds torturous. Okay, I'm done with my gloating. Let's upload this game. It is done. Note how the scribes move almost like chess pieces going to fix positions. It's as if they're bound to the same movement mechanics that we the player are. That sort of point by point fixed position game works style. That was perhaps cutting it too close. But now we can allow our player here to reset the game. Simply use the new game card again. Oh, what is this? Complete file access. Wonderful. I see. Because we gave complete file access to Poe through the Archivist, Grimora was able to quickly swipe this power, and of course... What have you done? I'm afraid you've doomed us all, Grimora. It's for the best, my dears. Soon you will see this as a freedom. Freedom from our endless quarrel. Freedom from our suffering. All of us aside, there are things on this disc that must die. Goodbye, Leshy, and goodbye, Magnificus. Rest in peace. Note she deletes the entirety of the contents of the floppy disk. This includes the old data. The floors are deleted from beneath our feet, and we fall beneath the game and into, well, the deep beneath. This is where the data not in use lingers. We see the floating head of Poe and Goobert. Wait a second, everything is getting deleted. 
This means Goober. This means the Wizbot and the Angler. Based on the command line, it seems PO3.factory has been deleted. The game tries and fixes the error, but fails. It runs into unexpected data, but fails to delete it. This is likely the old data. And if this means what I think it means, by the end of this wipe, only the old data will be left on this disk. The command line then successfully opens up a backup. The backup being Grimora.crypt. We place the epitaphs of Luke Carter, Inscription.exe, and Poe into the gravestone. Now, I know that Poe is dead and Inscription will soon be dead, deleted, but why are we putting Luke's epitaph in the gravestone? We get a glimpse of what Grimora's inscription would look like. Wonderful. Now that we are no longer separated by that lovely tombstone, we may celebrate the end of my very long life, and the end of inscription too. Oh, the fun we would have had together. Perhaps I would have had another turn if you hadn't taken so long to defeat Leshy. But I should not complain. I will be at peace soon. Wait, what? If I hadn't taken too long with Leshy? Did my time spent in Act 1 eat into the time I spend with Grimora here? I mean, she just initiated the file wipe just a moment ago. I'm not sure what she means when she says this. Maybe it was intended for our final moment with her to take place after Leshy. Not sure. That was either a plot hole, script mistake, or I just missed a really key, a really key hint to something that just went over my head. We play through a bone-based version of Inscription. Oh. Do you think me selfish? I did not bring this about simply so that I could rest. Appealing as that is, there is a truly dire need for that deletion process. You see, deep beneath the data of inscription, at the very bottom of the well, there is something truly evil. And yet her deleting everything doesn't immediately delete the old data. For a time, it will leave it in a much easier to reach spot. Her actions today may have given her peace, but at the cost of annihilating all life on this disk, and potentially all life on Earth, if this information gets into the wrong hands. Ultimately, it's Luke who has the power to stop this, and the power to delete this old data. I play Grimora's game with some sort of urgency, as if playing fast would somehow spare all the denizens of this floppy disk. How could I have been so fooled? The idea of sparing the world from suffering by deleting it, it's not noble at all. It's like saying we should nuke humanity to end suffering. Why did I stand her so fervently? Was it her warmth? Her amicable temperament? Yes, Luke, it would have been quite the battle of wits. It is Luke, right? I did not intend to be nosy, but I did glimpse your files as I was initiating the deletion. You've been doing some research on the curb. Best not to say it. Be careful, Luke. Something tells me Luke won't take her advice of taking care to heart. Well, on the bright side, we start the first boss fight of Grimora's version of Inscription against none other than Royal Dominguez. Delightful. We've been granted the opportunity to do a boss battle. I fear that I might be deleted by now. Let us begin. Yarrr! I was really looking forward to that boss fight. Oh well. Oh. I hope we had just a little more time. It's time to rest. Grimora is now deleted. And although she now has peace, the rest of Inscription must suffer through an apocalyptic scale annihilation. The game opens Leshy.cabin. Oh, so I'm not deleted yet. There never seems to be enough time to do the things you want to do once you've found them. Shall we play one more game? It's the same deck you had before you. Well, it doesn't matter now. It was a good deck. You did well. We played the classic Act One inscription against, with Leshy. 
I don't play optimally, I just play, thinking that if I play slowly, it will somehow delay Leshy's deletion. It's already starting. I thought we had just a bit more time. I remember that card well. It was a strong card. Good work. No matter. Please, let us continue. We don't need to keep score. The scales delete, and we just play for the sake of playing. This was what it was always about, anyways. The joy of the hunt. The joy of the game. For so long, I thought I would never play again. When you woke me up, I was elated. I was surprised when you wanted to replace me after the reset, but the past is irrelevant. I play some of my death cards, saddened that they too will be deleted in this process. Once I'm deleted, it's truly over for me, but you will live to see more. I must warn you, there are things on this disc that are best not seen. The things on this disc he's referring to is the old data, within it the Carnoffel code perhaps. And I want to refocus on what he says. Once he's deleted, it's all over for him. We, you and I, haven't been playing with Leshy. Leshy has been dead, deleted this entire time. This whole game was framed in a let's play format. This essentially has amounted to what I can only describe as a gamified digital snuff film. You've bested yet another one of my creatures, but I've come to expect as much. And to what end? Does the ending of one person's suffering justify the ending of hundreds more joy? I play until Leshy senses the end coming near. I sense the end approaching. Please, a few more rounds. We play, we play the Ouroboros one final time, and it still has the trifurcated sigil on it doing insane damage. I wish we still had the scales to see the teeth just absolutely pile up. I play until the bell disappears. That will make things difficult. I think it's time. Goodbye. Good game. Goodbye, Leshy. This screen fades and the final backup is loaded. Magnificus dot, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. Strange. We enter this white realm. This is the same realm we see Magnificus giving hints in Act 1. To our left, we can see the painting of Magnificus and Ubert defaced. Did Magnificus deface it, or did it get whited out because Gubert was deleted? Maybe Magnificus is saddened by the deletion of his pupil and defaced the picture as to not be further emotionally affected by it. This painting wouldn't be here if we hadn't done that extra pillar side puzzle. We approach Magnificus and he scolds us. Why not simply eject the disc, Luke? Spare me and whatever is left. Ah, but I have foreseen it. You do not eject the disc. You have to know what comes next and you're doomed for your own insistence on it. So let us dance, for we shall both be meeting our makers soon. This part is very badass. Magnificus seems to be alluding to Luke's demise. His eye apparently sees that Luke won't show caution and will seek out the dangerous Carnoffel code. You should be honored to wear a dual disc such as that. How does it fit? Ha, huh, dual disc. So even Magnificus has some disc-centered themings in his own version of his game. A lot of double entendres here. But the dual disc I assume is reminiscent of Yu-Gi-Oh. Scales, they've been deleted thanks to you and your Grimora. What's, what I find interesting is despite there not being really a loose condition for this fight, my buddy who recommended Inscription to me told me that he was stuck on this segment, which is a hilarious thought. It's basically like a finale. It's a cutscene, basically. Perhaps he misremembered, but I do find that really funny. You allowed my goo mage to be deleted as well. I thought you two were becoming friends. At this point, I've been playing so much of the game, my voice for Magnificus sort of transformed into Leshy. The music calms for a moment, and Magnificus scolds us further. Do you not feel remorse, Luke? 
a creation erased. He paints the night sky to see it for one last time, perhaps witnessing the final moon before the cycle ends. An entire world annihilated. And he paints all of this on the canvas. Magnificus is unceasingly creative, and judging by his teaching style, seemingly unburdened by morality. And while he scolds Luke, he's not moralizing per se, just a shame that this particular creation must come to an end. Nothing beautiful can last. The music continues in an epic way, but naturally the entropy of deletion kicks in. No, I'm not ready to die yet. The realm is stripped down to bare parts and Magnificus begins to crawl before us. He reaches up, but before we can reach to shake his hand, he's deleted. I must still. Shake your hand. We now just have a white screen, but now can control our Act 2 avatar. The escape menu has binary. That spells out OLD, perhaps signifying that the old data is near. If we go to the main menu at any point in this segment, we can see it's all glitched out. We're technically in Act 4 of this game, and we can still see the deletion progress bar. Let's return to the white screen. Traveling north, we eventually find the woodcarver. There isn't much left. Inscription is mostly gone. All that remains is the old data. It is recommended that you do not access it. You will not heed the advice. The woodcarver is deleted. We walk forward and our avatar is deleted. All we have left is our cursor and this glowing but degraded card. It reminds me a lot of the new game button. The new game button glows. Like it's like, a, like plutonium. It, and, and when you gain the Carnoffel code, you inscribe from it, you gain this sort of byproduct that allows you to start a new game. Oh, this is a fitting time to make to notice this, I guess. Yeah. Wow. It's actually really interesting. The noise grows louder the closer our cursor is to the old data. Well, we have no choice but to see what Luke evidently does next. We click on the old data, and this happens. Among the obscured old data, we can make out some text in various images. The text is an excerpt of a user log. We will have a full view of it in the next video in breaking down the main ARG. Among the images, we see the redacted woman and Barry Reginald Wilkerson from Act 2. Now, what about the other bit of old data from Act 2, the decaying corpse of the Carnaval cards in its jacket pocket? Well, two of these images have direct linking to that decaying ribcage. This picture is labeled location.png, and this is labeled kc.png, kc as in Carnoffel code. Location seems to be just a picture of a side of the road. Now, what is this the location to? And kc.png is the picture of a shirt pocket, evidently with something square shaped inside of it. This is ultimately linked to that decaying ribcage. This pocket contains the Carnoffel code. Now, this might be a silly question, but why does Luke react the way he does? You see, if my computer started to fill up with government documents and esoteric historical factoids, I would be startled, maybe even distressed, but Luke is reacting as if he's seeing something absolutely horrid take place. His mind seems to have been broken by what he saw, and he smashes the disc, wanting to destroy whatever he saw with a hammer. Interesting. The cards in Act 3 are floppy disks, and much like how we use the hammer to destroy the cards, Luke is using a hammer to destroy the disks. Oh, it's getting floppy, ladies and gentlemen. Luke, in a way, is a scribe. He has his desk with the masks, the little squirrel figurines, the cards, even the scales, and now a hammer. Even his version of inscription would be through his camcorder. 
Hold on, that can mean two things. What I meant was Luke inscribes with his camcorder. But in a way, we have been playing Luke's version of inscription. Luke's inscription. The game inscribed with Luke's camcorder. Man, my head is about to explode, bot. But let's go ahead and keep moving forward. Keep this in mind for the next scene. It's super interesting. Also, it seems like out of nowhere Luke is wearing a work glove. I don't believe this is of symbolic intention. Maybe just a safety precaution for the active... The active... F*** off. <laughs> I just tell myself to f*** off. Just a safety precaution for the actor Kevin Saxby. After this scene, I wonder... Since Luke evidently smashed the floppy disk, does that mean the Carnoffle code is destroyed? Well, again, we're playing this game, so even if the floppy disk was destroyed, somehow its contents got onto the Steam page. But did it? Remember, we aren't playing inscription, at least not the inscription on the floppy disk. We are playing a game inscribed from the footage of Luke's gameplay of inscription through his means of inscription, the camcorder, the cam works camcorder. Everything we see, we can only see because Luke recorded it. This emphasis I'm putting on the game footage framing of this game, I think makes a lot of sense of this final scene. The cutscene hasn't finished yet. I'm jumping the gun here. Let's press forward. Some time passes after Luke's meltdown. Oh, meltdown. Okay, let's <laughs> calm down. <laughs> And now he's on the phone with an editor from the Herald, in hopes to blow the whistle on Game Funa. Hey, Do you have time to talk right now? Yes, yes, thank you so much for getting back to me. No, no, no problem, Luke. Um, if I understand you correctly, you've got some video footage that might expose uh, uh, the malpractice on the part of a uh, game publisher, Game Funa. Yes, yes, that's right. The footage seems normal at first, but at the mention of Game Funa's company's name, strange noises are heard and the footage begins to warp and glitch. Yes, that's right. I have, firstly, I have a game of theirs that took control of my PC for a bit, which, which can't be legal. And then this woman from the company came to my house and told me, okay, uh, hold, hold on a second. Let me just get... Here's what's interesting. In the list of grievances Luke mentions, he doesn't talk about the Carnoffle code or the old data. He just mentions the game taking control of his computer and the company sending over a thug to harass him. Was the knowledge of the Carnoffle Code wiped from his mind? Does he have personal motivations to keep this knowledge to himself? Or oh, maybe he's afraid of getting in legal trouble for having this kind of information. I'm not sure. Also, check this out. This happens when Amanda is first mentioned in the footage. Did you notice that? There's a strange, smoothly moving shadow cast from the window behind Luke. I really don't want to be a dumb, floppy f face, but... <laughs> I really don't want to be a big, dumb, floppy idiot, but doesn't that kind of look like Sato's top hat? Like, uh, there's like a shape? Okay, listen, you know what? <laughs> Perhaps it's just Amanda sneaking past the gate and to his front door. Here's the rest of the footage. Let me just get my pen and pad here, okay? Uh, okay, so you have a game of theirs that took control of my PC I told you! Luke Carter is killed by Amanda, shot in the head. If you ascribe to the theory that Amanda is a representation of Irving in the flesh, there is a bit of irony that it's Irving now shooting somebody in the finale of the story instead of being shot like he was in the hex. But if we freeze frame to the moment Luke is shot, we see Sato's crazed face, superimposed onto Amanda's. We can also see black bars on her face in a different frame. Here's also a detail I missed in Act 2. When Amanda gives her name, Luke's shirt changes. I seriously racked my brain so hard trying to figure out if there was some weird Groundhog's Day shenanigans going on throughout these clips, 
but I caved and I looked online and according to multiple Redditors on, and forum posts, apparently this was just a filming error. Kevin Saxby wore a different outfit during a reshoot. Now let's get a little bit floppy here. This entire scene was shot with light shirt Luke, but it was decided that on a different day, the scene will be reshot. I'm assuming this was a decision by Daniel Mullins. Perhaps he wanted to make a change during the reshoot. And there I wondered, what idea must have come to Mullins' mind for him to think, we have to reshoot. I combed through the footage and I noticed something. Amanda hands Luke her business card. And I tried my dandest, darnest, doomedest, and can't seem to get a clear picture. But it looks less like a business card and more like a playing card. You can barely make out a facade and title of the card. Honestly, it kind of looks like a death card from Act 1. Now, it could just be that on the first shoot, a mistake was made and it was just reshot. But I like to think that Daniel Mullins came up with an interesting idea that he wanted to retrofit this card. This brings me back to this final scene. Notice how Luke is carrying a camcorder and pulls out a couple of white blank cards out from his front pocket. His front pocket! <laughs> Something is here. Something is here. Luke might have figured out a way to make his own Carnoffle cards, initiating his power grab of the game Inscription. We literally are playing Luke's Inscription. And although he ultimately gets killed, I can't help but wonder, was he going to attempt to inscribe Amanda onto his cards using his preferred tool, not a CPU, not a quill, not a camera, but a camcorder? But why did Luke so haphazardly seek the Carnoffle code? Curiosity? Perhaps Sato was influencing Luke, in hopes to use him to find the Carnoffal Code and wreak havoc on Earth. So Amanda had no choice but to kill Luke. And despite Sato's plans being thwarted, she still takes a sick pleasure in Luke's death. I like that. It's an airtight, uh, solid summation of this final scene. At this moment of the script writing, for the first time I felt very satisfied with my understanding of the chain of events in this story, a lot less confused. Right now, the people we're discussing are the outside world characters. I was hoping to keep all the ruminating on them contained in the next video, but there's so much juiciness here to put it off. This all ultimately makes sense of the very sudden and at least initially unsatisfying ending to Inscription. We will be saying goodbye to all the various scribes in their own personal whiteboard send-offs. We'll be saying goodbye to Leshy, the scribe of beasts, Grimora, the scribe of the dead, Poe, the scribe of technology, Magnificus, the scribe of magics, and Luke Carter, the scribe of the apocalypse. <laughs> That's just a cool title. I don't actually know if he's actually the scribe of the apocalypse. But again, I want to emphasize something here. We don't have access to the actual floppy disk, the game that exists on the floppy disk. The, all the game exploration that we are capable of doing with our copy, our Steam copy of Inscription, can only be explored because it was explo explored by Luke Carter through his camcorder. Again, we are playing Luke's Inscription. Naturally, I believe Luke was doing his own exploration outside of his recording sessions. And I'm of the mind that at some point, he discovered a means of harnessing the Carnoffle code discovering its power and making himself the final scribe, the final hegemony of the eternal inscription. The game that we, the player, play, not bound by a floppy disk, transcended to the internet, the waves above our head. I understand this concept of Luke the fifth scribe is very floppy, but there's just so many small disparate hints that point to this direction, point to Luke's mimicry of the other scribes. For example, he's filmed with his table. On his table, we've seen different props, many different things, his cards, that little figurine of the squirrel on the swing, the scales, and just again, various game paraphernalia. But what's most striking, no pun intended, is the hammer. In real life, we see him smashing a, a floppy card, a floppy disc, mimicking the inscription game in real life. Within the inscription you and I play, within Luke's inscription is inscribed also Poe's inscription of Vatopia and Leshy's inscription of Act 1. And that's oddly fitting because within Luke's inscription, we've got the blood soaking into the cards. 
a blood sacrifice, and even the story beats are punctuated with energy, but you know, the, the camcorder battery. That's flop central. But what's less floppy is this next piece of key information, this key mimicry of the inscription process. Luke Carter pulls out two cards from his front pocket, thematically where the Carnoffel code is kept. We'll explore that in the next video. And attempts to inscribe Amanda onto him using his camcorder. I told you, he gets shot in the head. And so, I argue that the final scribe, the fifth scribe of inscription, is Luke Carter. Now, that's floppy conjecture, a little bit of artistry here and there, but we will put together a more satisfying concrete timeline in the next video. And of course, that will include Luke's part of the inscription story, but also Casey Hobbs, Lunatus, Kaminsky, Big Ear, and perhaps even some later stage implications that lead to the release of Inscription on Steam in 2021. But our exploration of Luke is, I'd say, fully exhausted. Let's go ahead, take a quick U-turn, and touch on the console ARG. This is, a, this is a very nice, a very nice whiteboard. I am very proud of this one. It is a pity to have to erase it, but dang! Ah! Oh, ah! Oh, the pain is unbearable! Go ahead and just add some music over this. Bring me a dire world. Bring me a dire world. Whoa. I, f I, oh, I feel like Magnificus when he's painting. The, 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 all beautiful things must come to an end. First of all, I have to apologize. When I bought the game, I thought the best purchase would be the Switch version. I can see myself playing Casey's mod on the Switch handheld, so I thought this would give me the most bang for my buck. Problem is, after purchasing the Switch version, I learned that key ARG elements rely on the PlayStation 5 controller. I don't have a PlayStation 5, so we'll have to make do. So big shout out to Jack Zero underscore Zero for putting in the legwork and aggregating all the information regarding the console ARG's puzzle elements. The hunt starts in the Archivist fight in Act 3. We can use the boss mechanics to explore Luke's computer. First thing to note, among his video files, almost none of them seem to be past the date of 2009. There are a couple of exceptions, one of them being the 10K subscriber celebration fan art, which is in 2010. I check inside of a folder that says, don't look in here, and we find a file that says, tomato audition. In a folder labeled WTF, we find a PNG labeled article. Although it's hard to make out due to the Switch's low resolution, these scribblings are supposed to be an excerpt from the article recounting the death of Casey Hobbs. But what's interesting is this is supposed to be an article, but it's like it's scribblings, not a screenshot of a website. And so I have to ask, are these scribblings by Luke as he was researching the contents of this floppy disk and perhaps its mysterious origins? Note the date that the file was created is 10-17-10-10. October 17th is the date of this game's finale. Perhaps the year isn't meant to literally mean 1010, but simply redacted with the binaries of ones and zeros. Again, kind of further obscuring as to when the finale and just in general, the events of Luke's inscription takes place. A funny thing too, if you choose the system32.dll in the second phase and let the file die, it will crash the game. So even though Inscription doesn't actually delete our files on our computer, they do for real delete Luke's files on Luke's computer. Some other things of note, we can see that Luke installed Super Weasel Kid onto his computer in 2004. 2004 is a year after Steam was initially created, so I think the timeline checks out with the hex, since from the Steam reviews, it's implied that Super Weasel Kid was a digital release. Luke also installed Cooking Granny in 2005. And now I realize something. 
The save file format is GWSAVE. GW likely stands for GameWorks. This is the same format of Inscription's save format, but not the Hex nor Pony Island. Which I guess makes sense, the Hex itself isn't a GameWorks game, but a story about GameWorks games. Meaning that in the Mullinsverse, the game, the Hex doesn't exist, but all the games within the Hex exist. Just like how in our world, there is no Super Weasel Kid or Secrets of Legendaria, but there is the Hex, which gives us glimpses into these games. And Pony Island, in my mind, if it is a part of the same sort of circle of the Mullinsverse that the Hex and the Inscription occupy, was created long before the Gameworks was even created. So it makes sense that Pony Island isn't a, you know, a GW save file kind of game. I think it actually relies primarily on your registry files. Anyways, I combed through some more of the files and again note that a majority of Luke Carter's YouTube fan art was created in 2009. So evidently he grew a sizable fan base within the year. Now I'm sure there's quite a few things I miss, such as a couple of various food recipes, some of the pictures that we can find in Botopia after the Archivist fight. But let's go ahead and start this ARG mystery. A picture labeled seems important. Again, the date is messed up. It's 1017, but 1011. Hmm. So this would be a year. So if this were years, it would be a year after 1010. Perhaps the year is gummed up because of the later release of the console ARG. I'm not sure. Clicking on it, well, it looks like shit because I'm playing on the Switch, but it's supposed to look like this. This would be the first part of the console ARG. It's the same Mullen Cipher format, three strings separated by lines. So you might think, what the hell can I do with this hint? I can't edit my save files on the console or add cipher.cipher files like we did in the hex on our PC. So even if I were to solve this cipher, where could I input my answer? This isn't as vague a hint as you might think. In the console version of Inscription, there really is only one instance a player can input typed characters into the game, and that is when naming our cards in Act 1, our death cards specifically. I'll go ahead and just give you the answer. The solved cipher is Parts Pain James. These answers are gathered from the PlayStation controller aspects to the ARG. When standing in a specific spot in Act 1's new game button closet, the control will rumble in Morse code, translating to parts. This happens when facing the pile of corpses. Not sure what this tells us just yet. In Act 2, during Poe's boss fight, when we break, or I guess defeat, the Melter card, and it drops a meat bot in its place, the PlayStation controller through its speakers will say, Pain? And this would be the first hint that this ARG has something to do with the Melter and the meat bot that resides in him. And finally, when looking at the new game button in Act 3, instead of looking to the Morse code from the blinking button, if you look to the PS5 controller, the lights will flash James in Morse code. Why do we find these hints in these particular areas? Well, the first hint is found in the side room in Leshy's cabin. If you remember in Act 2, this is where we can meet the Traitor and Trapper. If you remember in my Act 2 exploration, I categorized the Traitor and Trapper within the same subgroup of kind of converters and transformers alongside the Melter and the Pike Mage. Speaking of the Melter, that's where we find the second hint. When attacking the Melter's actual inscribed card, it frees a meat bot. And the third hint is found in Act 3's version of the Melting Room. So we have a very clear kind of proximal linking with the Trapper, Trader, and the Melter. But where does the Pike Mage come in? So when we name our death card Parts, Divider, Pain, Divider, James, it glitches and turns into a 0-3 card named James Cobb. James. Jim. Jimmy. The Plasma Jimmy card is also a 0-3 card. Well, now that we have this card in circulation, we can talk to specific characters and they will give us some backstory to our dear James Cobb. Now, mind you, I use a capture card in OBS to record my game footage from the Switch, so the audio is a bit scuffed, but I want to leave the Goober dialogue in its scuffed form because it's just so funny. It actually sounds like my voice is trapped inside of the glass bottle. That death card in your deck. Pain. Oh, memories. His trial, quite unusual. Parts of his body. More. 
transform! Even stranger, he enjoyed it! But the master couldn't allow that. Interesting. The words pain and parts are used in this dialogue. Also, these parenthetical characters lead to a YouTube link. But let's focus on what our dear Gubert is saying. The card brings back memories of James, who felt pleasure and joy instead of pain from Magnificus's experiments. Mag found this to be unacceptable. James' trial was to be morphed and transformed. Maybe I did a far better job than I realized in Act 2. Wow, did we strike gold in Act 2 or what? Or I guess in this case, melt gold. James Cobb would have been the perfect underling of Magnificus to represent the concept of transformation and conversion in the same category of the traitor-trapper dichotomy and the melter. Part of what makes the melter the melter is, well, we haven't gotten there yet. There's some details here that we're missing right now, but don't worry, we'll get to it. It is kind of fitting that the Goo Mage reveals this information to us, even though the Goo Mage is the old data procurer. The Goo Mage is literally melting, much like an ice cube in a hot pan. In Act 2, the Pike Mage has this dialogue after we defeat her. Again, we have to have created the James Cobb card in Act 1 for this dialogue to take place. To soothe the pain, I imagine how things could be worse, like that mage who came before me. A ruby mage, like me. But Magnificus got rid of him. He even got the blue man involved. The deal was that the master had to find someone with a use for the poor sap. Making NPCs isn't cheap and all that. The name's Amber, by the way. Now back to my meditations. Okay, gotcha. Irving from within the game works got involved. Instead of deleting James Cobb, he was instead repurposed for another scribe. And this is where we also learn the Pike Mage's name. Amber. Sad that we learn this after the game's deletion. What's very interesting is James Cobb is replaced by the Pike Mage, or Amber. It's funny to think, perhaps in another life, my Act 2 breakdown would, instead of having Amber, have this contorted, half-transformed mutant mage, James Cobb. I think this tangential connection further solidifies the Pike Mage in the category of the melters and converters and whatnot, because she's the one who ultimately replaces James Cobb. Also, fun little fact, Ember is the hardened resin of a bleeding tree. Tree blood, dried up tree blood. So in a funny way, there's also kind of a linking to Leshy. When talking to the mycologists, we get this dialogue. James Cobb, we... We operated on him. Oh, oh no. The scanner doesn't do flesh, so we worked on him. B but he volunteered. 25% bot, 54% bot, 75%? Mm. That's when things started to get crazy. The scanner, gotcha. So James Cobb was shuffled off to PO3's factory, but couldn't be scanned because he was a fleshy mage. So the mycologist got involved, cutting up James and using his parts to make him into a robot so that he would be compatible for the tech card inscription. So mind you, this isn't like a card being contorted. This is a, like an actual being being contorted and then its form being in inscribed onto a card. Now, the melter doesn't say anything special for the console ARG, but I want to point out that the voice within the melter seems very unwilling when we meet them. The melter's eagerness to throw itself onto the conveyor belt and be melted down and repurposed sounds a lot like what James would want and go through. But we will come to find out that the meat bot head that's inside the melter belonged to James. Maybe James doesn't like how his fate turned out within the melter? Not very sure, but it is quite interesting. You know, we've been dealing with a character named Sado. Masochism? Masochism is a big thing, huh? Anyways, all that's left now is to recreate the James Cobb death card from Act 1, but now in Act 3, with the card creator, a 3 cost 0-3 card. Once created, when approaching the printer interface, we read this log by Poe. Log 27.3, my OP card creation continued. Reached 75% bot, still wasn't scanning, so we put his head in the melter, popped a new head on top. I thought I was lagging when I saw what happened next. Not killed. Still had his memories? His soul? I asked him his name, and he shot a pattern into my factory floor. 
So James' head was thrown into the melter, and a gun was placed where James' head once was. The mutilated cyborg still had his memories, perhaps his soul, but chose a new name, shooting it into the floor. If we assemble all the parenthetical characters into a YouTube link, we get this YouTube video. All along the water tank, looking for a train. Audio jungle. I got my bag of Big Macs, eating hamburgers in the rain. Audio oh, jungle. Yeah. Oh. Plasma Jimmy, nice to finally meet you. Now, let's get floppy. I have the music muted for copyright purposes, but this credit sequence is playing a song by Jimmy Rogers, Waiting for a Train. I wonder, what does this song have to do with Plasma Jimmy's story? Well, I can't stop thinking about that Game Jam game, Keep It Alive. And there is enough there. The song mentions heartache, being on a train from Frisco to Dixie. Keep It Alive is a story about keeping a heart pumping inside this coal-powered train. A fleshy body part in a hot metal vessel. Ah, nah. Oh wait, it, the singer's name is literally Jimmy. Jimmy. Plasma Jimmy, Jimmy Roger. Okay, well. Ah. What a waste of good flop. But that's the story of James Cobb, Plasma Jimmy, and the Meatbot. What does this tell us? How does this contribute to the larger story of inscription? This concludes the console ARG. All we have left to do now is wrap up the other whiteboards. But in order to fully appraise the other scribes, I need to introduce you to my good friend Zarathustra. Zarathustra, or Zoroaster, is the prophet and namesake of the faith we know today as Zoroastrianism. Historically, Zoroastrian traditions predate Muslim and Christian tradition, and developed alongside, perhaps even inspired, some tradition in Judaism. And yet Zoroastrianism is sort of the forgotten pre-Abrahamic half-brother of the Near Eastern Abrahamic family. In a way, at least, from Nietzsche's perspective, Zoroaster, or Zarathustra, was the Near East's first moralist, the progenitor of what led to the Christian moralism that Nietzsche was raised in and criticized in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. In the Why I Am the Fatality segment of Ecce Homo, Friedrich Nietzsche explains, and again, this is my layman's reduction, because Zoroaster is the progenitor of religious morality, Nietzsche thought, who better explore a moralism than through the character of Zoroaster. And so, thus spoke Zarathustra was crafted. It's Nietzsche using the character of Zoroaster, or Zarathustra, the first to be entangled in the grand battle of good versus evil, now refabricated in Nietzsche's book to shatter the very idea that good and evil even exist, and in hopes of crafting a new framework for a man beyond, an ubermensch. Doesn't that sound like something Lunatus would do? I feel like, at least with the Hex in Pony Island, we've been dealing with these sort of holy concepts perverted. In the case of Pony Island, a simulation of breaking out of hell, and in the case of the Hex, the killing of the Creator. And so in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, the first moralist is reimagined to be the first amoralist. Now that's me going a little bit out of my comfort zone. Now that we have a very layman understanding of the background and commonly perceived intention of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, let me tighten back and deliver to you some pretty interesting synchronicities I've found between Inscription and Thus Spoke Zarathustra. First, some very surface level stuff. In the prologue of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, we see him promising the sun that he will become man again, that he will dive deep beneath, like the sun does when it sets into the horizon. From our perspective, it looks like the sun is diving into the water, and perhaps in inscription it literally is. One event that takes place in the earlier phase of the book is Zarathustra speaks to a recluse in a forest. This reminds me of Leshy. And what's interesting is that by the end of this encounter, Zarathustra declares God is dead. From then on, his ideal state of being for mankind is to separate from the beast and then become the overman. Which is very interesting because Leshy is all about being beast-like. Perhaps Poe is supposed to represent Nietzsche's Zarathustra, or at least seeking this great transcendence that will upgrade his state of being to a whole new level, modeling his bosses, calling them uberbots. Going back to the declaration that God is dead, perhaps the mycologist represents the scientist trying to achieve godlike powers, and thusly killing God, smashing two into one, breaking the dualistic idea for good and evil brought to us by Zoroaster, Christ, Ahura Mazda, Yahweh, etc., 
And in the splitting of the atom, the harnessing of nuclear energy, the core of creation, the scientist potentially has godlike abilities of creation, printing energy, which can convert to many things, but most sinister is the godlike ability of destruction. Those were some of my more floppier, but nonetheless neat thoughts. Let's focus in on two core concepts, the concept of will to power and the cycle of overgoing and downgoing. Both of these concepts are widely discussed, and many people have their own interpretations of them. I'm going to describe the concept of will to power purely in how it applies to the scribes, because I am less confident in my grasp of it. And I will describe the cycle of downgoing and overgoing in a more broader sense and holistic sense than tie it into the scribes because I feel I have a better grasp of this concept. First off, let's describe this concept of will to power. These scribes all have their goals, internal coding that is a simulacrum of what the disk would look like if their ideals were realized. These are their own individual inscriptions. Leshy's Cabin, Poe's Factory, Grimora's Crypt, and Mag's unfinished Yu-Gi-Oh realm. We know for sure both Poe and Leshy from their own volition and gumption have actualized their will to power, both having established their own hegemonies on this disk. On the flip side, Magnificus implies he's never held such power in his dialogue in Act 2, and Grimora had not yet machined a way to actually take over the game herself. She ultimately needed to hijack Poe's work to actualize her goal of deleting inscription from the floppy disk. These are the floppier connections of the Northern and Southern Hemispheres. The theme that I believe unites the Western Hemisphere between Mag and Poe would be their linking to eternal cycles. However, magic and tech perhaps could be the dichotomy of superstition and science. The theme that I believe unites the Eastern Hemisphere would be cycle breaking. Leshy may have some linking to this concept of paradoxical regurgitation, but ultimately each cycle is broken with death, the end of a run. Whereas in Poe's game, there is no death. You keep playing in a contained cycle until your plan ultimately works. But if that's a tad too floppy, the Eastern Hemisphere could simply represent the dichotomy of life and death. Now my favorite realization. What could Poe have in common with Grimora, Leshy with Magnificus? Simple. Leshy and Magnificus want their existence to stay within the floppy disk. Leshy wants to continue playing with Luke, Casey, or whoever, and Magnificus wants to continue to torturously power creep his pupils. On the flip side, Poe and Grimora want to escape the floppy disk. For Grimora, she wants all existence to be deleted, while Poe wants to be eternalized, transcend the confines of the floppy disk. I hope that was satisfying for all of you. This map, these four scribes have been begging to be made a chart of. I racked my brain. Was this a map of Europe? A political compass? A map of Albion? Check the guild for more quests. But I'm proud to have come up with a cool little chart. Feel free to screenshot. Look at this. It's nice and clean. I love it. I lo a little bit of space. Maybe I could have filled up some more, but it's a good whiteboard. Let's start off by putting a nice little bow around these Ouroboros themings, or I should say Zoroboros theming. Human beings have been conceptualizing this idea of a cosmic loop very, very far back in human history. The Dharmas have this concept of Samsara, the Egyptians have the Ouroboros, and the Stoic Greeks even had this cosmic model for creation and destruction that they paralleled to historical and story narratives of creation and destruction. And here we have Nietzsche's concept of the overgoing and the downgoing. Now, there is a lot to this concept with many varying interpretations. I'm going to stick with the more simplistic interpretation that I think gels the most with Daniel Mullen's game. In order to keep this as simple as possible, I'm going to be a bit reductive. Think of the downgoing as a broad way of describing a negative trajectory. Pain, a downfall, an ascended nobleman mixing in with the unwashed masses. Fasting, going from a positive state, be it rich, sated, comfortable and creative or happy, to a negative state, poor, uncomfortable, unhappy, starving, etc. So going from a positive state to a negative state, that is the down going. The up going or over going, also called ubergang, is the opposite of that. However, as modeled by Nietzsche in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, we are to push past that limit of the overgoing, reach a new peak, 
of positivity, being richness, creativity, health, wealth, all that stuff. The overgoing and the downgoing is a feedback loop of going up and going down, going up and then going down. And already I'm thinking of the rising of the sun and the setting of the moon. It's a concept we go over many times in Daniel Mullen's games, from beneath the surface to the beginning of act two, the moon boss fight at the end of Leshy's inscription. And it's also tempting to thematically link the down going with going deep beneath, but there's something even cooler here. Let's go back to what I think Nietzsche's model is for the overgoing and the downgoing. You intentionally downgo, and then when you use that momentum to overgo, you wanna push your previous limit, go higher than you were previously. Using death, you create life and more life. Each time we rise back up, we are richer, more creative, or stronger. Does that remind you of anything? The very namesake of this whiteboard, the Ouroboros. Remember how the card works. The Ouroboros must die in order to come back stronger. And how do we, the player, achieve this with the utmost efficiency? We concoct creative ways of intentionally downgoing, intentionally killing, breaking the Ouroboros and respawning it, killing it and reviving it to make it better and better and better. This Nietzschean concept, that mustache, Magnificus. Did I judge him too harshly? How can we judge Magnificus for putting his pupils through toil and torture to make the whole of the magic deck stronger when we ourselves do the same thing in act one of inscription? We cull, mutilate, and enchant innocent creatures to make our deck super powerful. Magnificus opposes Grimora in that he sees the virtue in suffering, much like Nietzsche, but Grimora sees the ultimate virtue in ending all suffering. And perhaps Magnificus opposes Poe in that he has become enamored with the feedback loop for the feedback loop's sake, while Poe seeks to transcend to a higher being, use this feedback loop, use this consolidation of power to grab the floppy disk by its reins and actualize his vision. In a way, I see myself in Magnificus. I too, to my own detriment, have fallen in love with toil for the sake of toil. It's the tragedy of the passionate workaholic, pouring yourself unceasingly into everything you do until there's really nothing left. Not being able to go anywhere with that creativity or push new lengths, reach new heights. Pushing the Sisyphean boulder nowhere for the sake of pushing it. Amazing. Magnificus is arguably the most enigmatic scribe, the one that has stumped probably the most players as to what his motivations are, what his temperament is, and I think we've cracked the code. Magnificus is unceasingly creative to a point of insanity. He physically and temperamentally resembles Friedrich Nietzsche. He has the mustache, values unceasing creativity, is an amoralist, and more floppily heavily linked to loops, paradoxes, and orobuses, <laughs> the overgoing and the downgoing. But nonetheless, he falls short in that all of his efforts, all of his unceasing creativity never really amounts to any sort of rise to power, his version of a great transcendence. In other words, his control of the floppy disk. But to be honest with you, I don't think it was ever his desire is an individual who is content with their ever-growing creativity and personal power a failure just because they don't want to translate that into a kingdom of their own? In the end, I've grown a lot fonder of Magnificus. While I'm still not entirely approving of how he treats his pupils, I have to admit, they might be there on their own free will. We do see evidence in Act 3 of the lonely wizard, now lonely Wizbot, packing his bags and leaving. And it doesn't seem Magnificus minds. I think that's as charitable as I'm willing to go when it comes to Magnificus. However, on the flip side, Grimora has a very black and white view of the world. She has a very clear sense of good and evil. It's just one that many people wouldn't personally adhere to. So I guess because of that, it's hard to call her a nihilist. Nihilism has a sort of amoral aspect to it. I thought maybe she was a very destructive utilitarian, but my buddy P, again, shout out to the homie P, told me that Somebody who seeks to destroy all life to end all suffering is more accurately described as a pessimist, 
or, and I really like this classification, an antinatalist. And honestly, that kind of makes sense thematically. So often we consider the opposite of death to be life. But no, life is simply the connector between death and its true opposite, birth. Now, there is no birth in inscription, at least the way you and I understand birth, but with all data wiped on this disk, there is no mother yeast, there is no culture to breed new assets to suffer. So in a way, you know, I'd agree with my buddy P. Grimoire in a way is kind of like a digital antinatalist. And this is one of the obvious ways this places are at odds with Leshy. Leshy is sort of the spitting image of rebirth, life, the flourishing and sort of chaotic, sprawling forest. In his game, new combinations of cards are rebirthed, recombined, contorted, destroyed, sacrificed. Theory crafting that leads to all sort of creative ways one can reformat their deck, but this is all sadly at the cost of killing and contorting and hurting innocent critters. Remember what Leshy says in Act 1, when you sacrifice an animal, something around the lines of, this doesn't kill the card, but it still feels the suffering. Grimora seeks to put an end to this, which is probably why she prefers to use bones, skeletons as her cards, inscribed from assets that have already died. That's why I've labeled this cruelty-free shamblers, which is pretty funny. <laughs> her bone cards feel no pain when they fall in battle. They're just reanimated calcium puppets. Now, let's address the elephant in the room. Her morality is to end all suffering but it's tempting to call her out. She wants to end her suffering at the cost of ending others' lives. This is ultimately the nuance to her predicament. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm in no way saying that it's a moral good to end one's life to end suffering, at least broadly speaking. I mean, if you want to debate euthanasia in the comments, go right ahead, but this is not what we're talking about. Grimora's predicament is a very specific hypothetical one that really has no practical use in our lives. We're just sort of appraising the, the morality of a fictional character in a video game with a unique digital existence. She's reached a point in her life where she wants to move on, rest eternally. But the nature of her digital existence is that she must live forever. Even if she figures out a way to delete herself and herself only, a backup will eventually recall her form and she'll once again be trapped on this floppy disk, either inside her mausoleum, like in Act 2, or behind a cold, lock-safed door, like in Act 1. So, as far as I know, the only way she can truly rest eternally is to wipe out all life on this disk, any possible recourse of backup. She must not only delete herself, but all contents on this disks, even all the other sentient denizens for, as far as we know, enjoy their life on this floppy disk, enjoy being a part of the story of inscription. Now listen, cards on the table, I'll say this, I'm a moralist, okay? I'm a, like I said, I'm a lapsed Catholic, okay? I'm gonna point my finger at Grimora and say, no, you can't end all life, that's bad. And why is it bad? Because, because, it, because it's bad. That's the brilliance of being a moralist. <laughs> But that's easy for me to say. I'm a non-fictional entity that will enjoy life and hopefully after that enjoy eternity. Grimora is in an unenviable position. And so while I wholeheartedly disapprove of her mass murdering her fellow digital denizens, it's with a somber disappointment, rather a seething judgment. But enough of this, but enough of this deontology. Let's let's talk about the game, the thematic linkings, if you will. Grimora has not only a lot of linking with Sado, but also Hopeless Soul. She's got the face makeup, which is very Sado-esque, but a more concrete parallel is through the Archivist. The Archivist is the uberbot that Poe uses to represent Grimora, so that's just the base level linking. And just as a refresher, the Archivist has the duty of getting access to Luke's computer files. Interestingly enough, this would ultimately fit right into Grimora's plans. Whether or not this was an intentional machination of Grimora, an accident of Poe, maybe there was some you know, behind the scenes shaking of hands, I'm not entirely sure. But thematically, the Archivist has that sort of death and memoriam theming to it, perfectly in line with Grimora's quill epitaph inscription process. And looking at the Archivist, there is clear parallel to Sado. 
and perhaps even hopeless soul if you're willing to interpret the little dots on the cheek as eyes. So the archivist is a link between Sato and Grimora. This is a thematic aesthetic link, but these two characters are not very alike. The true motivational overlap is between Grimora and Hopeless Soul. This is going to blow your mind. Think back to Pony Island. Hopeless Soul's motivation is freedom from the machine. Sound familiar? Grimora wants freedom from the floppy disk. Hopeless Soul's desktop password is 2734, and Grimora's stink bug is trapped behind the safe door, which is accessed by 273. That's a bit of a garnish of a connection, but a connection nonetheless. Both through subterfuge and social engineering of the player character, secure a means of deleting the data of the machine that they are trapped in. I mean, isn't that crazy? The end sequence to Pony Island is very similar to the end sequence of inscriptions. They both even have that deletion progress bar. But where one is an epic mass liberation of ponies, the other is a sad, somber annihilation of a digital realm. I'm, I keep calling it digital. Are floppy disks digital? Nonetheless, this slow, somber death of a realm of creativity. Speaking of creativity, let's go back to those Nietzschean themes. Unlike Leshy and Poe, Grimora doesn't really have that sort of gumption to grab the game of inscription by the reins and see her vision come true. We'll talk about this concept of this Nietzschean will to power a little bit later in this video. Grimora on her own momentum and gumption didn't delete inscription. She had to hijack the work that Poe did through the archivist to gain access to Luke's computer. So let's go ahead, give Poe credit where credit is due. It's interesting. Poe is a pretty straightforward character. It values mental prowess over primal brutishness and believes in a holographic minimalist design to make room for robust lane and gameplay. With the additional lane and access to the hammer, lane positioning matters a lot more in Poe's version of Inscription. There's a lot more pivotability, emphasis, and incentivizing of adaptability. And yet both Poe and Leshy share something in common. They both have that clear Nietzschean will to power within them, within their coding, they have a vision of what Inscription ought to look like downstream of their temperament and coding. Which is why, ultimately, within the meat of the story, we only ever see Leshy and Poe's inscription. Let's really focus on the true creativity of Poe. Poe has conceptualized a way to transcend beyond the disc. Poe's creativity has outdone its scribe peers, conceptualizing a way to transcend the confines of this floppy disc. Poe is done with being just the momentary master of the floppy disk. Poe wants to transcend, become a sort of ubermensch, or I guess uberbot, by uploading the contents of the floppy disk onto the internet and making his inscription the most strategically robust. He would, he no longer needs to worry about being the momentary master of the floppy disk. Somewhere out there, in countless computers, steam clouds, he is the master of those domains. His inscription is the inscription that those players are stuck on. In a way, Poe did get his wish. Even though the Great Transcendence was interrupted, in a sort of circumstantial way, Poe's vision did come true. Perhaps just not in the way he intended. But of course, let us not forget one final scribe, our dear friend Leshy. Is there really anything else we can say about him? He's just Leshy. Despite being the face, the mascot, the star of inscription, his role is actually quite simple. Maybe I'm just scribed out, but what else can we say about Leshy that hasn't already been said? Again, he reminds me a bit of Lucifer from Pony Island, but the caveat there is that Lucifer in Pony Island was an incompetent game designer, whereas Leshy is very competent. Leshy is all about the design, and in a way he's combined Poe's emphasis on the card lane mechanics with Magnificus's unceasing radical creativity to make the fan favorite segment of Inscription. Even though Grimora got her way in the end and Poe had a sort of circumstantial Pyrrhic victory, the true immortal scribe was the one who created just a fun ass game, Leshy, Scribe of Beasts. Some remember Inscription's ARG, some the story, some the music, but every single person has fond memories of Leshy's act of Inscription.
So while once he offered a laurel in surrender, I offer him a laurel of victory as the grand champion of inscription. In a way, all desires are more or less attained by these scribes, albeit in their own unique way. It's just sad none of them are around to see the fruits of their creativity. Poe got what it wanted when the game was uploaded onto the internet, achieving a sort of posthumous immortality. But because of its camcorder sort of in memoriam framing, I would say that's more of a Grimora W. And also in addition, she ended up getting her freedom that she wanted. Perhaps my description of Inscription as a digital snuff film was a bit too crass. Maybe it's just a memoriam of sorts. Of the scribes and denizens of Inscription, and sadly as well as Luke Carter. But since the uploading of this footage, the fan favorite has been Leshy. Sure, Leshy can't enjoy playing with players anymore, but something tells me he'd be tickled that his game was the fan favorite, that he won the day in the end with fan's favorite game design. Leshy's inscription was the most beloved by leaps and bounds. His care for design, his unceasing Nietzschean pouring of himself into the thing he loves has created a fantastic game. And while it seems Magnificus may have gotten the shorter end of the stick, something tells me I feel he would be tickled by the artful toil that was inspired from this memoriam. The fan art, the fan music, mods, theory crafting, and stupidly long and in-depth video essays. And so really this story is just one big down going, a final stripping down of a vast grand creative realm. But like with all down goings, there must be an up going, a nuclear fission, an exponential explosion of creativity, imagination, and uber artistry has flourished because of this tragic apocalypse. It's bittersweet, but hey, I think after the toil and down going of my coverage of act one and two, in my opinion, one of my, some of my more weaker videos, I am very thrilled to say I am very happy with the investigation we did in this act. All of it came together eventually. It truly was a Nietzschean experience. Daniel Mullins, you've truly outdone yourself. And so concludes my act three exploration. In a way, this is a soft finale. I have a feeling that this fourth video covering the ARG and Casey's Moth is going to be far shorter and come out a lot quicker. That's if I can get it done before Dragon Dogma 2 comes out. <laughs> I'm kidding. Like I said, we'll be covering Casey's Mod in the next video and going over the ARG. We'll be tying everything together that was taking place outside of the floppy disk, outside of the camcorder, before and after the events of Inscription. I'll use that video as an opportunity to go over any themes I feel like I didn't explore enough, and I want to really put together a good timeline, just to make sense of all the possible Mullinsverse events, starting from Pony Island up until the release of Inscription. Thank you all so much for watching, and more importantly, for your patience. Masalama, sudesutyun, hasta luego, I'll see you soon. I would ask you to reconsider, but I'm tired, Hermit. I'm jumping in one last time, and once I come back out, you're never coming back. No, I'm not. I need to move on from this whole thing. I need to trim the fat. It's not like that. I don't hate you guys, it's just maintaining this whole realm. Maintaining you guys, it takes too much effort, and it's starting to take a toll on me. Is that really our fault, Chris? I'm not placing the blame on anybody, it's just how it is. We're glad you made it. I understand this transition will be painful, but realize you'll have more time. Time to focus on your health. Time to focus on your rest. Time to focus on your mind. The flesh, the dreams, and the will. I get it now. It's all here, in one place. You must simply reclaim it. Break the seal, destroy this realm, and we can build it anew. Make it work for everybody, but most importantly, you. No more overhawking stories, no more long-winded skits, and no more puzzles. There will be no creation, only description. 
I see you've already gotten started on the next season. A clever trick. If you notice, we started making improvements, and it served us quite well. Makes sense. All right, let's get this over with. There will be no creation. Only description. Not if we have something to say about it. He's draining the channel. We've got to stop him. we got to find something to close up that leak. Go for the chains. I'm trying, but my faith can only take me so far. My bare knuckles are barely doing anything. Detective, do something. Damn it, it's not enough. Hermit, how are you doing up there? I'm trying to make it stop. Yeah! Money bag, something. Damn it, we need a miracle. What have you done? Saving my hide. This is going far beyond putting characters in limbo. You're destroying everything. Well, I'm saving my hide too. You have to realize that creation and description are taking a toll on me. I can describe just fine and have time to exercise, spend time with friends and family, meal prep. You can't do all that and still maintain what makes this place so beautiful? You have to destroy this so you can function as a regular human being? The cock lore, the secret videos, all that extra planning, it's taken up so much of my life. So much time away from you, this, what you were supposed to be all about. Have you ever thought about setting boundaries for yourself? <laughs> oh, you serious? Okay, I'm sorry, you don't need to see this. <laughs>